Good, e good evening, everyone. And thank you for being here to those in person and for those watching us live streaming. I will ask our board secretary to take roll to establish a quorum for the record. Thank you. President Craighead? Here. Member Benitez? Uh, here. Member Lopez? Present. Member Miller? Here. Member Otto? Here. And student member Aguilar? Present. Thank you. We have a quorum. Thank you. And now I'd like to ask our uh, student representative from Browning, Stephanie Ortiz, to lead us in the pledge. All right. Please stand. Place your right hand under your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. For those of you present in the room, the board appreciates and supports community input at our meetings. During the meeting, there will be time for the public to comment on matters on the agenda and matters not on the agenda. For those who have not already submitted a request, we have provided forms by where our board secretary is. And if you'd wish to speak during the meeting, please fill out a form indicating your name and the agenda item you wish to address. The board has been meeting in closed session regarding matters listed on today's agenda. The board took action on the following items. In item 3.2, conference with legal counsel, existing litigation, the board voted 5-0 to approve a settlement agreement in the case listed on the agenda. Regarding item 3.3, public employee discipline, uh, dismissal, release, the board took action on two matters. By a vote of 5-0, the board approved a retirement agreement and general release regarding an employee. The board also voted 5-0 to approve a resolution that authorizes the dismissal of an employee. Um, now we are at adoption of the agenda. No. Not that I am aware of. So move approval. Second. Uh, discussion? Um, we'll have you take a roll call vote on that. Thank you. Member Lopez? Aye. Member Otto? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Benitez? Aye. Member Miller? Aye. And student member Aguilar preferential vote? Aye. That passes 5-0. Thank you. Um, and now we'd like to hear from our student representative, Ms. Stephanie Ortiz from Browning. Okay. We're happy First to have all, you here. <laughs> Good afternoon, no? everybody. It's nice to see some, you know, familiar faces like Dr. Christopher, Dr. Baker over there in the back. I recognize some of you guys, and it's like amazing to be, you know, in front of you guys again. So I am Stephanie Ortiz from Richard D. Browning High School. I am a senior and I'm gonna be a part of the first class that is gonna graduate with their associate's degree in hospitality due because we're, you know, enrolled with Long Beach City College. So, um, you know, at school, it's just, it's been such an honor to be taking those college classes. I started at sophomore and, you know, already as a senior, I'm gonna be getting my AA degree. Also, you know, my high school diploma, the two in one. So it's been such an incredible pathway. And you know, in the beginning it has been challenging, but look at this now, you know, I'm so excited and looking forward to looking at my classmates. Um, I believe there's gonna be like 35 seniors graduating for the degree. So that's really exciting. And I'm looking forward to also seeing more and more students. And it's, it's just like, sometimes I get, you know, a little teary because I'm not also doing it for myself, but for my family who, wasn't able to, you know, take those college classes in um, high school. Also because, you know, my I have, I'm Hispanic, I have Mexican parents, so they weren't able to finish, you know, middle school. So it's like, I'm also doing it for them too. They're, you know, gonna be graduating with their degree as well. And I'm just looking, I'm looking forward to graduating and, you know, showing them my cap and gown from LVCC and Richard D. Browning High School. And it's like, you know, it's just, it's been such an incredible, like high school experience. And I'm just like, it's amazing. I'm like really looking forward to, you know, graduating and being there with my parents and like, you know, Dr. Mont, um, 
yeah, Dr. Ramon, my principal. So it's just, it's been such an honor to be in front of many of you guys also in different um, meetings. And it's like, it's such, it's such an incredible, like, you know, I can't explain it. It's just like, it gets me so emotional because I'm just like, I used to be such a shy kid and not look at me now, you know, speaking in front of you guys. So it's been, it's such a pleasure to be here today. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's wonderful to have you. Yeah, thank you for being here. Um, let's see, I think we'll take a break after we acknowledge our retiree, and then we'll have a little break to do pictures. So if you could stay, um, stick around. But also, um, I know you acknowledge your principal. Is there anybody else here that you'd like to acknowledge? Uh, first of all, the Long Beach City staff that are able to stay at our high school. Um, Mr. Miyaki, he's the pathway coordinator. I'm really close to Dr. Ma and them too because they've been such a, you know, such a big help, you know, guiding me through these college classes. Also, you know, the professors that go to our high school, you know, we don't have to go to the college campus. They come to us, which is such an incredible thing. And I'm just, you know, really honored to also, give a shout out to my classmates, of course, because we've been helping each other since day one, you know, with the college classes. And everybody at Richard D. Browning is such a big help to us. That's wonderful. Dr. Benitez. There's a, a, a word in Spanish that doesn't really land in English the same way uh, that I kept thinking as you were sharing uh, today. Orgullo. Mm -hmm. Pride. <laughs> pride, right? There, there yeah. does, it doesn't kind of land the same way in, in English. No knock on having pride, but it was a different, um, you know, cultural uh, affirmation. Um, can you say one more time for us that you're graduating with an AA degree and a high school <laughs> degree, please? Yeah. Can you so, reiterate that for us? <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to be graduating high school with my AA degree in hospitality, so hooray for that. <laughs> and where are you going with that AA degree? I'm hoping to go into Cal State Long Beach. Um, you know, I'm planning to hopefully study abroad. Like I said, in Costa Rica, Dr. Christopher Lund, he's heard about me, you know, saying that. And, you know, I just want to be out there in Costa Rica. It's such a, such a lovely place. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, thank you so much. And I'm glad you had to repeat that part because I'm sure there are a lot of people, you know, some, at least some of our millions of viewers that would be very interested to know that we, we have programs that make it um, uh, possible to have a two-year college degree and high school diploma at the same time. So thank you. No okay, so we will move on to our um, recognition of our retiree, but if you could stay and then We'll, we'll do um, pictures, that would be wonderful. She has me splitting Thank up you. here, Diana. <laughs> yeah. You're gonna have to calm funny. down. <laughs> I know, you have to calm down. We are very proud of her though. So that's wonderful. Okay, so we have a retiree to um, recognize. So at this time, I'm gonna ask Olga Urera to come forward to the microphone. And I'll just mention a few things about your um, your tenure with us here at LBUSD. So we are celebrating you for 24 years of service. You are retiring as a Head Start instructional aide, and you are being praised for being an accessible teacher, teacher assistant who constantly demonstrates professional leadership qualities in her everyday work and for promoting interactive and collaborative learning in the classroom by creating a trusting and safe environment for all students, and for showing a genuine concern for the well-being of all students, parents, and coworkers. So please accept this certificate for your 24 years of dedicated service to the Long Beach Unified School District and your lasting contributions to the lives of thousands of students. Thank you. Thank you.
Today, it's a mix of emotion for me, as I look back on my time at Head Start over the past two decades. It's all start when my daughter joined as a little one. I began as a parent A. Eventually, in 1999, I became an instructional A. It's been an amazing journey. Thank you to the wonderful educators in college <coughs> who have been a big part of my growth. Closing this chapter is tough because all of the memories with my colleagues and the kids. But I am also excited about what is coming next, being a grandma. <laughs> <laughs> While saying goodbye to the routine is hard. I take it with me, all the lessons learned and the warmth of the friendships. I wanted to thank everyone who has been part of my journey to support and friendship has, been, um, has meant a lot to me, to the new beginning and the joy of watching the new generation grow. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And thank you. So at this time, we'll have a, a, a little break, and we'll have our student from Browning, Stephanie, come on up here, and then we'll go ahead and do pictures. Um, So that's that. Um, and now we will have our, um, our vision in action. So I'll um, have you turn your attention to the screens. I am a social emotional learning facilitator. So an SEL facilitator supports school sites with social emotional learning. Part of what we get to do is provide professional development around our newly adopted Harmony curricular resource. Harmony routines really help support friendships, help students build identity, which really helps support culture and climate um, on campuses. It makes sure that we are focusing on students' areas of identity, agency, and belonging, which then directly correlates to our Pulse surveys. 
part of the rollout is being able to learn from each other and alongside each other and really talking about what benefits the students in the classrooms based off what we're seeing from the meetups. We're targeting listening right now, active listening, and what that looks like, sounds like, and feels like. And um, that's in response to what teachers are seeing their kids needing to work towards in their classrooms. Research shows that when kids feel like they belong at school, when they feel like they have agency over their learning, their academics improve. We've really wanted to make sure that students feel comfortable at school so that they're ready to learn. It's always nice to see what's going on in the district <coughs> to support our vision. Um, Axel, I understand you have something to share with us. So as you know, we began our third month of the year, March, which is Women's History Month. And we would like to celebrate the contributions of women in the past and present who have taken the lead in advocating for change, establishing firmer safeguards, practices, and legislation reflecting the unrelenting efforts of women across the country who recognize that eliminating bias in, is necessary for the better future. Thank you. Thank you, Axel. Um, okay, let's see. Um, now we are at uh, public testimony. Um, it's now time for public comment. We want to allow members of the public to make comments um, on items on the agenda. We will start with items on the agenda. Uh, each speaker will be provided up to three minutes. And let's see, we have um, a few, so we will start with April Acuna. Good evening, board members. I'm April Acuna, and I am speaking again on agenda item 14.3. Thank you for listening at the last board meeting, and please accept this clarification on several items regarding the abolishment of six BIS positions. Contrary to the statement that the board is voting on a notification of the possibility of abolishment, six supervisors were already identified and given verbal notice on February 6th that, what, that our positions would be eliminated. We have already been given our number on the rehire list and we're told we will be laid off. If a vote is passed, there is no indication of a plan to bring these positions back or for hiring for the two open positions that we were planning to hire for. Supervisors were told by an admin the layoffs were due to lack of or decrease in funding and shifts in enrollment. However, on February 21st, Dr. Baker verified the reduced funding is not allocated to the BIS positions and that it was an administrative program change decision, decision rather than lack of funds. The district has 550 cases contracted to outside agencies to provide direct intervention and supervision hours. These contracts pay outside agencies to fulfill the same role and duties as district behavior intervention supervisors. There are over 75 cases currently waiting to be staffed. It is abundantly clear that there is no lack of work and that these agencies provide essential work that 24 supervisors cannot do on their own. Education Code 45117 states a classified employee may not be laid off if a short-term employee is retained to render a service that the classified employee is qualified to render. So what is the plan then? Are we in violation of Ed Code by maintaining contracted staff in place of district staff? Or will we be somehow alternatively able to fulfill these 550 plus caseloads plus the 75 awaiting contracts? Will we be, the six of us, be rehired before agencies are offered contracts? Still so many questions. But one thing that has never been in question is the power of the work that we do every single day. As an example, I worked with a student whose desk was in the hallway for months. She spent 50% of her day outside of the classroom because the environment was too overwhelming. Excuse me. This eliminated her access to education and community events, especially movie nights where her parents love to take them on the weekends. Through my work, she is now a star student, a participant in a transition program, and her parents happily report that she chooses the movie selection when they go out as a family. 
Another young man had difficulty expressing himself due to a speech delay, and as a result, would engage in severe behavior that led him to a more restrictive program. After learning communication and how to manage frustrating situations, he's in a mild, moderate setting and taking general ed courses next year. He loves to explain to me the science behind the vegetables and insects living in the school garden. This is just a tiny fraction of the lives that have been touched and improved through the specialized work that we, all do, that we do to help all of our children reach their potential not just for themselves, but for the parents and the families and the entire community who thrive when children thrive. These students are not cases. Their children, and perhaps the most important piece, is eliminating the part of the discussion that these children will bear the repercussions of a district failing to meet their needs as a whole and complete individual. I, I hate to jobs. interrupt, but the time is up. Usually there's some kind of audible signal and we're not getting that. Thank you but very I'm much sorry, for that listening. I appreciate minutes. it. Um, next, we have Julie. Hi, my name is Julie Culling. I'm an IIC and math site lead. I'm speaking on agenda item 14.3. I invite you to listen with your head and your heart. At the last board meeting, when asked what the plan is to address the work that is carried out currently by six behavior supervisors, Dr. Simon stated, these are things we are currently still working on and are looking at what other aspects of programming can we utilize to mitigate some behaviors that we are seeing. She stated that we are looking at ways that we can mitigate or decrease the number of students going into special education by working on our MTSS approaches and also our positive behavior intervention services and supports for our school sites and that also allows for that decrease of our students entering special education. Members of the board. Your current team of 24 behavior intervention supervisors are affiliated with two statewide government networks that focus on multi-tiered systems of support, positive behavior interventions, and the use of evidence-based practices. Captain and Pent focus on function-based behavior planning, social emotional learning, mental health, positive behavior supports, and tiered interventions. They offer a school-wide systems approach, incorporating applied behavior analysis with PBIS. These multi-tiered frameworks are also included in the 1997 and 2004 amendments of the IDEA Act. Your LBA USD behavior supervisors are already working on MTSS and PBIS supports and services, and they have been for years. By providing training, services, and direct support to teachers, counselors, and administrators at their assigned schools. Behavior supervisors conduct trainings at the department and school levels based on the needs and requests of teachers and administrators at their assigned sites. Past training topics include positive behavior supports, behavior intervention plan development and implementation, and evidence-based practices. Four out of the 24 behavior supervisors are certified trainers who provide nonviolent crisis intervention training to teachers, administrators, counselors, and other staff across the district throughout the school year. This certification is critical for ensuring the best possible care and welfare for students with severe behaviors that pose a threat to their safety and the safety of others. NCI focuses on prevention, de-escalation, personal safety and physical intervention. It is required for all BIAs and BIS staff to maintain this certification which expires every two years. Please support the work already underway by keeping all 24 behavior supervisors. If anything, I can speak from experience at my own site, we need to hire more of them to meet the diverse needs of our students. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we have Michelle. I am Michelle Nielsen. I'm speaking on agenda item 14.3. I am one of the 18 behavior supervisors who will carry on the incredibly difficult work of intensive behavior intervention for some of the most vulnerable students in our district if you abolish these positions. I'd like to share some real life examples from our job. And they may make you uncomfortable to hear. And I'd like for you to remember that we live these stories every day in our work. We have talked a lot about severe behaviors. 
What we mean are students whose hands are permanently scarred because for years, whenever they were overwhelmed or afraid, they would bite their hands. We are talking about students who can't communicate with verbal speech. So when they are overwhelmed to get their caregiver's attention, they smash their heads into hard surfaces like windows and walls. And we are the ones who help. We are talking about students who run off campus and do not have safety awareness about the cars driving onto the freeway on-ramp that they are crossing. I could go on for hours. All 24 of us do this work every day. We run toward the crisis that nobody else knows how to help. Every year, we have more and more students with special needs and severe behaviors. And across our district, we have more and more students who experience have experienced or are experiencing ongoing trauma. Thank you for reimagining what we're doing to support the mental health needs of our students. We've been asking for that and we need it. And trauma and special needs are not mutually exclusive. Children with special needs experience trauma. In fact, a family with a child who has severe behavior needs is at greater risk of compounding adverse childhood events, such as divorce, loss of income because they have to stay home with their child, or housing, that's a real example from my work this year, or substance abuse by a parent who's just trying to cope with the challenges. I could go on. In many cases, trauma suffered in utero or early childhood is what causes developmental delays. A child who is exposed to methamphetamine in utero will not have typical brain de development and they may someday qualify in our district under the classification of intellectual disability. That same child will likely re be removed from their mother's custody and placed in foster care. So you can see that behavior and special needs and trauma are intertwined, and we have a both and problem. We need more resources for our behavior department, and we need to do more for our students who are experiencing trauma and mental health. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Sarah. Good evening, board members. Uh, my name is Sarah Fredrickson. I'll be speaking on agenda item 14.3. Um, I am also one of the 18 behavior supervisors who will remain if the six positions are abolished. I would like to share some information regarding the scope of a behavior intervention supervisor's job duties. The current 24 LBOSD behavior supervisors cover 15 high schools, 21 middle or K-8 schools, 47 elementary schools, and the entire special education preschool site. They are the fewest in number among sites and sites and counselors, yet directly supervise almost 200 staff who each have student assignments. In addition, to ABA, our backgrounds include education, counseling, psychology, family therapy, and mental health. We have been trained by this district in the areas of trauma-informed care and mental health from the Guidance Center and TICE, Trauma-Informed Skills for Educators. Instead of abolishing the six positions, please realize that our specializations, years of experience working in LBSD, and unique skill sets are assets that can contribute to the repurposing vision. Completing functional behavior assessments, which is a time-consuming and multifaceted process, is only one of our many job duties and responsibilities. Behavior supervisors work both in special ed and general ed classrooms. They support students who are eligible for special education services in at least 11 out of 13 classifications, not just students who are autistic or autistic-like. In many cases, our students have multiple disabilities and or disabilities alongside trauma. We provide oversight, collaboration, and checks and balances for all 550 plus contracted agency staff and supervisors for quality assurance and to monitor IEP recommendations for any non-evidence-based practices, interventions, or goals. Each supervisor manages a team of behavior intervention assistants, or BIAs. They are responsible for creating schedules, absence reports, providing ongoing training, performance evaluations, and ensuring that staff are implementing the interventions outlined in their students' IEPs. They also provide behavior supervision hours required for students based on their IEP. They ensure that the BIAs, the 
behavior intervention assistance, collect behavior and IEP goal data with fidelity and analyze that data to make informed decisions and recommendations for their students. They do all this while also responding to unexpected and unforeseen crisis situations that occur at their school sites. Please do not approve the abolishment of the six behavior supervisors. Please allow all 24 to continue the hard work that we have dedicated our lives to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, next, we have reports on superintendent advisory groups. We'll start with the business budget and policy development group, uh, Dr. Benitez. Thank you, President Craighead. Just two items for me to uh, report on and share with my colleagues that we'll have two policies on next meeting's consent calendar. Both are updated revisions. Uh, one is board policy 6142.7 on physical education and activity. And this is to update our current policy uh, around federal guidelines right now for physical education activity. The second is board policy 6020, parent involvement. And again, this is to uh, be updated in accordance to state and federal uh, guidelines, uh, specifically two uh, components that we want to make sure to codify into policy is around our uh, parent involvement with regard to our LCAP process, and then the second component, parent involvement with regard to our Title I schools. So looking forward to um, you all providing some feedback on those when we get them at our next board meeting. Uh, in addition to, we also have our um, board policy around grades and evaluation of student achievement tonight that will be presented to us. Thank you. And I neglected to mention that we did not have any speakers for items not listed on the agenda. Um, and that's why I moved on. Um, next, we have instruction and student learning supports. Ms. Lopez. No report tonight. Thank you. Okay. Um, workforce development. Mr. Miller. I also have no report tonight. Uh, Mr. Otto, do you have a report for student outcome focused governance? Yeah, I think Mr. Miller's been busy. So. <laughs> Uh, yes, um, we, we met, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, yesterday to talk about the Board of Education goals uh, three and four and to remind people goal three it has to do with algebra proficiency and it says in pursuit of having more than 80% of black African American students meet the al algebra A through G requirements by the end of grade nine, the proficiency gap between black African-American students and all other students will decline from 5% in June 2023 to 0% by June 2028. We had a, a healthy and a prolonged discussion about that. There, we're we're going to get some more information about that uh, uh, tonight. And, um, <clears throat> and then goal four has to do with college and career readiness. And goal four is in pursuit of having more than 66% of African, uh, black African Americans uh, graduating seniors A through G eligible, that's through uh, Cal, State, uh, uh, Cal, Cal State University system. Um, the proficiency gap between black African American students and all other students will decline from 15% in June 2023 to 0% by June 2028. We helped um, uh, put together uh, the presentations that uh, we're working on on an informational basis tonight, but uh, we're, we're making regular progress on it. And I want to thank the staff for all the work they're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, President Craighead, if I can just uh, add, thank you for sharing that out, uh, Board Member Otto. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that um, when we get our presentation tonight on the proposed new policy for grades and evaluation of student achievement, there's a big equity piece uh, anchoring that policy that's directly connected to board goals three and four that Dr. Otto, I mean, Dr. Doctor, look at that. Uh, that uh, People make that mistake all the time. Attorney at law, Otto, uh, board member Otto, uh, just shared. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that the presenters tonight um, explicitly uh, share how having an equitable grading policy is connected to us, uh, not just achieving our board goals,
but across the board, uh, what the impacts uh, are in achieving our district priorities uh, around student success, particularly for those students that we've received so much data around the last 18 months um, and, and how an inequitable grading policy uh, is an impediment uh, for us to actually achieve student success for our most underserved students. Thank you. Um, now we will move to the consent calendar. We'll need a motion. So moved. Approval. Second. Um, discussion. Uh, uh, yes. President Craighead, um, can I like to move to um, remove the abolishment section on section item 14.3? and to vote on that separately. Second. Well, the motion on the floor is that we vote on the consent calendar. She's Minus. asking. Mine is the abolishment positions for special behavior intervention supervisors. Uh, Mr. Strumfer, will you help us with this one? Sure, the motion in, uh, was made and seconded. Um, so that's the motion that's on the floor at the moment. Um, so that's where we're at. If that, if that motion would fail, then there could be a second motion. Okay, so. Um, are we a discussion? Yes, we are at discussion. So, uh, Board Member Lopez, can you talk about what, what the uh, rationale is for pulling the item? Sure. Last board meeting, there was, um, we voted on those positions to keep them, and two weeks later, they're back on the agenda. Um, now, my understanding was not, the, the vote was not to keep them. It was to pull those items, those six positions out for, um, and the, what I did is I requested additional information so that we could take a vote today. Dr. Baker, um, can, can we speak to the additional information? Sure, um, Dr. Brown's prepared to provide some additional information, but the board received um, a significant, a three-page briefing about those positions and the background on them. So Dr. Brown can speak to any of the specifics related to those, but that was with your, your board update. There were a number of um, resources, including links to the California Department of Education requirements. So that is available to you for additional discussion unrelated to the motion. Um, and so can we um, confirm what we actually voted on last week, just to clarify Board Member Lopez's understanding of our mm -hmm. motion and vote mm -hmm. from last, uh, not last week, last board Two meeting? Weeks ago, yeah. 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 The, the vote last time was for that item without those specific six positions. And it wasn't to approve the abolishment of those positions. It was whether or not to approve the potential or the notification of the potential abolishment of those cases. So the agenda this um, in tonight's uh, tonight's agenda includes the abolishment of those positions. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. That's not correct. It's it's to provide notice for the potential abolishment of those positions. It's to what? Um, it's to provide notice to the employees of the potential abolishment of those positions. So why isn't that um, indicated here? Here what we have is abolishment, lack of work, slash lack of funds, and then you just give us the behavior intervention supervisor, special ed, one, two, three, four, five, six positions, in addition to school support secretary. There is no mention here of a notice. It's pursuant to the education code sections that talk about the notice 
for the abolishment of the positions. That's, that's the education codes that are cited. <clears throat> 45117, it's regarding and notice. I, I don't know if Susan Leeming, Interim Executive Officer of the Personnel Commission is here, but in addition to the specific information about the Behavior Intervention Specialist position, the board was provided a briefing about the process and um, the deadlines for notification to staff through the Personnel Commission. A specific memo from Susan Leeming, in addition to the memo, there was an attachment that has the actions and the timeline that needs to be taken in the notification process. Mr. Otto? Yeah, I'd be happy to hear the report of uh, Dr. Brown uh, about, about this, this information, uh, just, just to hear it, but I'm not changing my motion. So you have a, you have a motion and a second, yes. and need to take a vote on that motion and second. Okay. Can't we in well, discussion? Uh, uh, get additional information? We, we can, and, um, and I think that while we're <laughs> taking a vote on the consent calendar with this item included, um, I will ask Dr. Brown to talk about the broader plan with different... Um, <coughs> can, I, can I ask you, Ms. Lopez, to ask a specific question? Well, I did spend time uh, speaking with doc Dr. Simon regarding these positions, and I just, um, so th there was rationale given to me, um, but I was very clear that I am, f I am in personally in favor of positions that directly impact kids versus replacing them with positions that are not necessarily working with students. So can you um, give us a, a broader picture of what that looks like as far as, you know, a, maybe a change in service to our special ed kids? Sure. Um, the, pro the document that you received from Dr. Simon and the explanation that you referenced um, refers to a change in the needs that we have in the specific job class that we're referring to. Um, and so in reference to the statement you made about service directly to children, one of the things that's important to highlight here is that the supervisor role is a management position that is not in direct service to students as the aides who provide that daily direct support are. That's an important component. Um, it's not to say that the supervisors do not offer insight and interact with students, but that's a, a main distinction that I think needs to be highlighted here. Um, the additional information, as we spoke about a bit in the last board meeting, is really around the idea that we do need uh, professionals who bring a variety of training and expertise that is not just specific to behavior, but also specific to the social, emotional, um, and trauma-informed perspectives that other professionals also bring. So we've heard from um, different um, people that have come to speak before us on, on um, the roles of, of this position and from the uh, memo we received from Dr. Simon, um, it talked about how um, there will be maybe a different distribution of these roles. I know one of the um, roles is um, participating in IEPs and the, um, let's see if I can remember the acronym, F, uh, oh, FBAs, the um, functional behavior assessments. So, and then I think just tonight um, somebody mentioned um, over, uh, 500 caseloads, was that it? I don't know where I made that note, but um, yeah, over 550 caseloads. So we are gonna, um, I guess, reimagine who's gonna be doing this work because we are reducing, not eliminating, but reducing the number of um, behavior interven intervention specialists. 
but also Supervised. increasing the um, hourly rate for our instructional aides. Is that right from the? Um, That's not my understanding, no. No, okay. but that we had already increased the hourly rate for the instructional aides. I, I don't I, know what you're referring to in terms of an hourly rate, Ms. Craighead. Are you thinking about the transition from 3.8 hour instructional aids to mm -hmm. the significant transition into a number of instructional aids that now are 6.0 mm -hmm. employees? Okay, so that's um, connected to service delivery, but not specifically connected to the behavior intervention supervisors. Okay. Yeah. And so um, can you tell us about the plan that we have? Because I know at our last board meeting we, um, we heard about a, a plan and I, I think that we should um, be as transparent as possible because we have, this affects so many people. Sure, um, I, I think what this is not meant to be as a staff report. Um, and so I want to be clear about that. This is a this is a for you to take action on six positions um, that primarily work to serve the needs of children who have significant behavioral challenges, um, primarily who are on the autism spectrum, and um, are being served by some of the people that you've heard speak tonight. Um, so that's what the decision is based on in terms of the plan that you're referring to, um, the steps that the Office of School Support Services are taking is really to look at the variety of needs that our students come to school with and determine the professionals who are best uh, suited to meet those needs to include other job classes. Um, and so you hear reference to the multi-tiered systems of support, and the core of that model is to look at how students present, what needs they present with, and try to match the needs that they have with not only the most import, uh, appropriate service provider, but the least restrictive type of service. Some of the things you've heard described this evening, even in public comment, reference the most significant types of behaviors. And I would offer assurance that the students who have um, that, that level of need will continue to receive the services that they've received. But we always have to be looking to provide support for the range of needs that are in front of us. And currently we have a lot of um, trauma-specific behaviors. We have a lot of social-emotional needs. And we have a need to provide services in the general education environment for students who are coming um, with a with a range of specific um, emotions, behaviors, and services. Okay. Do we have um, any further questions or discussion about this? And just to clarify the motion, it's to pull item fourteen point three from the consent calendar and vote on that separately. No, the motion on the floor is that we are voting on the consent calendar as it is. No. no. That no. was not the motion? Did you change no, the no. motion? No. No. It, no. Mr. Otto did not pull his motion. So the motion on the floor right now, and it's been seconded, is to approve the uh, consent calendar as as is. That was that was, that the was not my motion. My motion was right. to pull that section off right, the Right, but there was already a motion on the floor when you made your motion. So unless the person who makes a motion withdraws that motion, that's the motion that has to be voted on. You can't, you can't step over another motion. Who who uh, who motioned before me? Mr. Otto. Oh, you did. I thought you second. No, no. I, I moved to approve the consent calendar. Ah, got it. Who seconded? You did. That, I wanted to be sure that I seconded that motion, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So to be clear, the motion on the floor is that we are approving the consent calendar as is. That's the motion before us. So Wayne, I would I would encourage you um, for clarity for us that we not entertain motions when a motion's already on the floor with a second, because because we just went down a whole path uh, here. Um, well, so, actually, well, my, my my understanding of it was we we did have a motion in a second. Uh huh. 
Ms. Lopez made another motion on top of it, which we said cannot be a motion because we have a motion already. And then there was discussion. And I believe you asked, in that discussion, you asked Ms. Lopez to describe the reason why, what she wanted to do. Yeah. So we've had that discussion based on the original motion and the second. That's, that's the clarification that I would encourage you to remind us of that. Uh, All right. So thank you for that, Wing. Sure. Okay. So I will ask our board secretary to take a roll call vote. Excuse me. I, I, I wanted to make a comment okay. uh, about the motion on the floor and why I made the motion on the floor. And that is that at the meeting last time, I listened to what the tasks of the behavior intervention supervisors were, uh, heard testimony from a lot of those people, and I've heard a lot more of that tonight. And I think it's an incredibly uh, worthwhile activity that we engage in. And what I heard tonight was that these students that have these types of uh, behaviors will continue to be served. In the meantime, we've gotten feedback from staff and we've gotten uh, a memo uh, about all of this. And I sit here today looking forward and, um, uh, you know, this is the year of the smiling mortician. We are about to experience dramatic uh, uh, shortages in funds, increases in expenditures. Uh, according to the reports that we're getting, I see uh, the rising balance, excuse me, the, the, the balances that we will, uh, are expected to have to go down dramatically. So we're going to have to start getting tough about the way we spend our money. And this is the first of what I expect to be many uh, looks at how we deliver services. Uh, I, uh, I am incredibly appreciative and uh, uh, believe in the work that's being done, and I'm convinced by the testimony and the memos that we've been uh, given about that, that we will continue to deliver those services, and this is just a better way to deliver those services. And uh, I know that uh, it's very personal and it's very important uh, to, uh, to a lot of people, but I'm confident that by the elimination of these, um, of these uh, six positions, or is it seven, with the school support secretary, that we will continue to be uh, doing a good job in this area. That's why I made the motion. Thank you. Dr. Benitez? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Otto, and thank you for the clarification again, uh, Mr. Strumpfer. So I, I also want to clarify that Agenda item 14.3 is not just about these six positions. So we had a conversation about these six positions, but this includes appointments, leaves of absence, retirements, um, um, abandonments, uh, right, as well. So um, the, the, the vote for me also is in the context of everything you shared, Mr. Otto, but that we're not just voting on six positions uh, here tonight. Can I? Uh, of course not, We're, and and but but the, what what all the testimony's been about is uh, is those positions, and um, I have no problems with the rest of the recommendations, and I wanted to make it clear that I don't have a problem with the recommendations with regard to the abolishment or lack of notice of uh, or due to lack of work or lack of funds and the notifications. Uh, that, that are going out with that. So uh, that's why I made the motion. Okay, so if there's no further discussion, the motion on the floor is that we approve the consent calendar in its entirety. That's the motion on the floor. And I'll ask our board secretary to take a roll call vote. Thank you. Member Lopez? Abstain. Okay, Member Otto? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Benitez? Aye. Member Miller? Aye. Okay, and student member Aguilar, preferential vote? Abstain. So that passes four uh, with one abstention. Thank you. Um, I will just add that it never feels good to um, eliminate any position because a position is a, is a person and um, that's never an easy thing to do. Um, okay, uh, let me refer to the agenda. 
Um, next, we have consent calendar B. Yes, and so uh, out of abundance and caution, I will recuse myself from consent calendar B, item 15, as I have a potential conflict of interest under state law. Um, thank you. Do we have a uh, motion to approve? Move approval on uh, consent calendar B. Second. Uh, any further discussion? We'll have a roll call vote. Thank you. Member Lopez? Aye. Member Otto? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Benitez? <coughs> Excuse me, aye. Student Member Aguilar, preferential vote? Aye. Thank you. That passes for zero, one abstention. Thank you. Um, next, we have a staff report on budget alignment. I believe we have Mr. Suarez. Um, I'm not Mr. Suarez, <laughs> but he will be joining you. He will be ending it with a great finish. Um, my name is Viva Mogi. I'm greeting to high board members um, and colleagues. Um, we're going to start before I start the next slide um, where you'll see a video. Um, as you know, we are in the budget LCAP and planning season for the next school year. Before we begin the alignment process, um, we would like to reintroduce an updated video on our budget and LCAP process. Here is a primer video that we've been sharing with our community, students and staff, so that when we engage with our partners um, on our budget engagement, our stakeholders will have the same understanding of what LCAP and LCFF are and how schools are funded. We're looking for your best ideas on how to support our LBUSD students by engaging with us during this budget engagement period. But first, we'd like to give you an overview of our district and how the budget comes to be. The Long Beach Unified School District is the fourth largest school district in the state of California, serving over 64,000 students in the cities of Long Beach, Lakewood, Signal Hill, on Catalina Island, and unincorporated territory in Los Angeles County. LBUSD employs more than 11,000 full and part-time employees, making us the largest employer in the city of Long Beach. Every year, the Board of Education votes on and approves the district's budget as a planning document. This means that throughout the year, updates and new information about changes in revenues and expenditures are provided to the school board and community. $1.3 billion is used to support the general operations of our district and is divided into $891 million unrestricted dollars and $413 million restricted dollars. Unrestricted dollars are allowed to be used to support the operations of the district for employing classroom teachers and school administration and our curriculum and operational services such as those provided by our custodial, fiscal, and maintenance departments. This part of the budget is funded through two major factors, student attendance and the number of students who are English learners. Those that meet income or categorical requirements for free or reduced meal prices or are foster youth. Other sources such as lottery and local resources are also here. Most of the unrestricted dollars come from the state and is known as the Local Control Funding Formula, or more commonly referred to as the LCFF. Restricted dollars are required by federal, state, and local entities to be used for purposes such as supporting certain student populations, interventions for students in need, providing access to special programs, and locally donated funds for support of schools and offices. Examples of these types of funding are Title I, Special Education, or one-time COVID-19 support dollars. These vary from year to year depending on federal, state, and local resource allocations. It is vital for our community members to share what they think will be the best investments to support students. The input you give us will help the district figure out what programs and services to prioritize, especially for high-need schools and students. Please visit lbschools.net slash LCAP to join the conversation. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, as we, um, as you can see in this image in front of you, we wanted to kind of share how we are planning to draft the LCAP that we um, that was mentioned, the Local Control Accountability Plan. Um, as you see in the middle, the vision 2035 and the new board governance structure, uh, the board has set new goals and the staff has implemented a strategic plan. Uh, the LCAP is a plan uh, on the bottom, as you can see, to showcase how we leverage the funds allocated by the state. The LCAP also showcases how the plan aligns with state goals. Every three years, we set new goals and share our progress in the LCAP. This year, we will begin a new LCAP cycle, which means that we'll be in year one where we can set new goals and metrics. As, our plan for the L as we plan for our LCAP goals, the LCAP team, which we call ourselves the best team, have been going through an alignment process where the board goals and the strategic plan will align with the new goals and metrics we set in the LCAP. In the coming weeks, we will share new draft goals in the LCAP in the bottom, but we will be anchored in the, through the strategic plan themes that you see on your left-hand side around high quality learning for students, equitable and liberatory district, partnering with community and cultivating transformative change. You can also see where the goal, board goals will fit into these themes. And by having um, our vision 2035 as our focal point, our goal is to have the draft LCAP see the connection to your goals and our strategic plan. Um, now I'm going to pass it on to um, Jim where he will be sharing how all these factors that you see here today are gonna to fit into our budget. Thank you, Viva. Good evening. I'd like to connect what Viva just presented about alignment of strategic plan themes superintendent and board goals, and LCAP goals and metrics, and its connection to the budget. This budget pyramid should look very familiar to you. It illustrates the total general fund budget for LBUSD. Let's break this down further to show how we are mindful of cohesion and alignment as we develop the overall budget. This and the next slide represents the budget with the same layers of the pyramid from the previous slide. The only difference is we took off the dollar figures from each budget layer. Hopefully this will become clear on why we did this. Here are the two layers of the local control funding formula or LCFF, which is comprised of LCFF base, and LCFF supplemental and concentration funds. If you look to the left of the pyramid, wait, wait for it. Yeah, I, that, that's, that's the advanced technology that I provide. <laughs> look to the left of the pyramid, click. The local control and accountability plan or LCAP is the supportive document that explains the planned use of LCFF funding. We look at LCFF funds as the foundation of LBUSD's general fund budget, which currently represents approximately two thirds of the total budget. The LCAP details all LCFF funds allocated to the district and builds a plan about how these funds are to be spent, which is in support of LCAP goals. As Viva just described, we plan to write the LCAP goals and metrics to align with the strategic plan and your board goals. Continuing with budget alignment, let's focus on other layers of the budget pyramid. This slide illustrates the three other layers of the LBUSD general fund budget. More specifically, these layers are state grants and entitlements, federal grants and entitlements, and local grants and entitlements. These funds come to the district with restrictions attached. These restricted funding sources have regulations about how these funds are to be spent. In LBUSD for the past several years, we have been intentional in leveraging these resources in support of student needs. Where there is flexibility in local, state, and federal restricted funds, 
we capitalize on the use of these resources to augment or fully fund critical programs, many times resulting in freeing up less restrictive LCFF dollars. In previous years, you have heard me come to this lectern and speak about programs and services rather than funding or dollars. Why? Prioritizing needed services for students should be the first conversation. As you can see by the pyramid, there may be a number of resources that could be used to implement a prioritized program if we leverage the total budget layers rather than just pigeonholing the use of LCFF. To share how important this distinction is, I dug up a script that I used in a presentation to the board that I gave during the budget development process in February of 2021, which I'm sure you remember. And here it is. I'm going to excerpt right now, 2021. It's important to note that LBUSD's emphasis on programs and services rather than dollars helps coordination of an overall budget. There are many separate funding streams that comprise the overall district budget. To name a few, LCFF, ELO, ESSER 1, 2, and 3 at the time, they all have different regulations regarding allowability. But the focus should be on uplifting programs and services that meet student needs. This allows the district to determine a specific fund to use for a chosen program, so long as that program is allowable under the resources regulations. Still in 2021, this strategy has allowed LBUSD to map out a cohesive multi-year budget plan rather than several distinct plans that may not emphasize student need nor prevent standalone projects that are unsustainable. Let me give you an example. Oh, that was it for 2021. I want to give you an example where this leverage has taken place. Two weeks ago, we presented the mid-year LCAP update at the board meeting. As you may recall, we announced that all of the planned actions of the current LCAP are in progress. We also called attention to a couple of programs listed in the LCAP that had very little expenses to date. One of these actions was LCAP Action 2.2, Community Services, which funds recreation, some recreation aids for both during school and after school programs. We continue to fund recreation aids, but we have leveraged a restricted state source. The Expanded Learning Opportunity Program, or ELOP. However, the nature of ELOP restricts funding of recreation aids to after-school program enrichment. So, LBUSD leverages the ELOP dollars to fund the after-school recreation aids, while funding during the school recreation aids through the LCAP. This is just one example of leveraging the top layers of restricted funding to align efforts of the LCAP. This leveraging of restricted funds is a very important tenant of budget development. This year, we plan to continue efforts to create a cohesive budget through a budget development process that looks at the whole budget, state, federal, and local funding as well as LCFF funding, so that we can provide programs and services that align with the new Vision 2035 strategic plan and the board and superintendent's goals. I'd be kidding myself if I didn't mention engagement tonight. So I wonder where I could start. lbschools.net slash LCAP. We are once again calling on our educational partners, our students, staff, parents, and community to participate in a unique thought exchange that has two tiers. One, 
a survey to prioritize current programs and services, and two, an idea exchange to interact with other participants and sharing of ideas that should be considered during our budget development process. And you're wondering where you can find this thought exchange? Anybody? www.lbschools.net slash LCAP. Thank you. Okay, do we have any questions or comments about the budget? Um, <laughs> I'll just mention that um, we've been provided with um, not just a copy of the budget, but a budget summary that is very helpful because it takes all the information within the budget and um, provides highlights and, and things that we need to take a look at. So it's not just totals of um, what our operating budget is and what uh, different buckets of money we have, but also provides context on um, state funding for education and uh, what we're facing for the foreseeable future. Let me see if I can find the um, timeline. Um, we are facing revenue decreases over the next three years of approximately seventy-seven and a half million dollars. So as we face that grim reality, we know that our work as a board is um, going to be harder, um, actually not just for the board, but for staff, because we have to find ways that we can maintain our services and programs for our students at a high level while receiving less money. And that's a challenge. Sometimes uh, that's harder than other times. When I um, joined this board in 2012, it was at the tail end of the Great Recession and we were still um, in the process of cutting things and that was over a, a period of years where we were cutting things. Hopefully that's not the future we're facing now because I definitely do not want to go back to that time. But I have my trust in this staff that they prioritize our students and that every effort is made to keep cuts away from our classrooms, that we maintain our high levels, high levels of standards, that we anchor our work in the vision for excellence and equity. So I just want to thank our, our staff. I want to um, you know, thank James and Renee and Viva for providing us this information and um, you know, going forward. We, we may hit some tough times, but we know that um, decisions are made with our students in mind, and we do the best we can. Uh, Mr. Miller. Thank you, President Craighead. Uh, going into 24-25, uh, we know that the district's going to look a little different. Obviously, we know our financial situation is going to be um, completely different from uh, the past three years due to the lack of ESSER funds. We've been very transparent about that from the beginning. Um, as we go into this conversation about uh, this transition, uh, I do not want to lose sight of our larger uh, district goals and some of the, um, let's call them accountability metrics that the community has held us to when it comes to uh, the things that was talked about in Vision 2035, the things that we've put in our board goals, and one of the things that we've talked about more than anything when it comes to uh, all of these uh, levels of accountability has been around a targeted approach towards those items. And so this is the opportunity for the community to get involved, to speak to some of those targeted approaches to improve some of those uh, district efficiencies. And so I would hope that uh, 
those that are listening, it's millions, right? We have millions of people watching. Uh, of the millions, um, uh, folks would uh, find an opportunity to uh, get engaged in some uh, way, shape, or form because uh, this is important conversation. Um, as you stated, um, changes like the ones we've had to make today and changes like uh, that are going to be coming over the next coming years potentially are always tough and uncomfortable and can be disruptive in all honesty to some campuses. But being involved in the conversations, talking about ways that we can uh, leverage uh, what I call social capital. I've said it multiple times, but we find ways to utilize folks from the nonprofit sector or relationships uh, within the private sector uh, to continue to support our uh, teachers, to support our students, to support our district are going to be important. And so, um, being at the table is the first step. So I hope that more people, uh, like the millions that are watching today, find a way to get involved. President Craighood, because you yes. brought it up, I also want to point the public that to the memo that you made reference to because it provides a lot of context um, about this year's budget as well as out years. So connected to the second interim financial report, thanks to Yumi Takahashi and Renee Arcus, there's a very instructive memo that the public can, can reach through tonight's board agenda uh, materials on board docs that is really, I think, for anybody who's interested in out years and some of the things that you made reference to, that is available to them as well. Dr. Baker, since, since you brought it up, I'll, I'll build on that. I think one of the things that oftentimes our communities see, uh, those 1.3 billion uh, that are watching, is they see uh, you know, $800 million plus uh, of LCFF funding. Um, and the context that my colleagues here and Dr. Baker just referenced, this is in the midst of us still receiving potentially a lower May revised budget than we were anticipating. It's in the context of a cost of living adjustment uh, that we account for, that the team uh, pays very close attention to. Uh, this is in the context of uh, declining enrollments, our attendance challenges, and specifically with LCFF funds, and I love the video, our um, unduplicated students, uh, right, that we get the supplemental uh, funding for. So. Um, I wanted to highlight those in, if, because that's exactly what's in the memo, Dr. Baker. And so oftentimes we do you know, talk about a $1.3 billion budget, uh, but the context is you know, that's why we had healthy reserves. That's why fiscal decisions are made based on um, that we're not always going to be getting one-time funds, Mr. Miller. Uh, we're not always going to have a 12% cost of living. Uh, adjustment or 11 point whatever it was Renee and so we have to account for that right and so at the end of the day the decisions before us as a board the recommendations that you and the executive team uh, make uh, Dr. Baker have to be anchored in something right and there is a finite uh, pie of funding and so I think it's important for our community members to know there's a lot of ad advocacy that's needed at the state level uh, you know, Dr. Brown at previous board meeting and at this board meeting referenced the decisions around whether it's SPED, whether it's Rec Aids, uh, are in the context of um, we have to prioritize students and we have to prioritize our most underserved students. Uh, and so that doesn't mean all students aren't taken into account, uh, but it does mean that we have difficult decisions, not just tonight, before us and so I, I am proud of our board for adopting board goals and guardrails that ensure that we make equitable decisions around the budget i'm proud of our bold, of our of our bold uh board goals that ensure that our most underserved students aren't disproportionately negatively impacted by difficult decisions that are before us so i would encourage our communities to check out that six page memo that renee and the team and you and me put together because it, it very explicitly, very clearly uh, illustrates um, the context of these tough decisions. Thank you, Mr. Otto. Yeah, I, I, I wanna from that same memo, but point out two things that uh, I think are indicative of what we're looking at and where we're going. And that is that, uh, for example, um, this year um, uh, the, um, the, the COLA, 
that was anticipated uh, was 8.22%. And that's a lot of money. And uh, we've been working with that number and thinking, well, okay, that's, that's our COLA now. Uh, that'll fund a lot of activities for us. But, um, but next year, it's anticipated to not be 8.22%, but 0.76%. And uh, I, I don't think I've ever rem I ever remember uh, a number that low. Uh, and so we have to make adjustments because uh, of that. So that's one number. And the second one is the one that, um, that I mentioned earlier tonight. Um, generally, our revenues are going down and our expenditures are going up. Healthcare costs and whatnot, we have to pay those. Uh, utilities and everything else are going up in, in your local bills as well. If you look at the what, what I think is probably the most important statistic that we get, it's the un um, the unrestricted ending fund balance. Now, in 2023, last year, it was uh, set at $409 million.5. Uh, um, uh, this year, it's anticipated to be up to $435.9 million. But over the next two years, it's excuse me, three years, it's expected to go down to Two hundred and sixty point nine million dollars, and that is an extraordinary drop. I don't think I've seen that drop uh, in the time that I've been on this board or on the community college board uh, before, even or, uh, before. And so we have to be prepared for that, make adjustments. Uh, generally speaking, um, uh, we're we're known as a district that has reserves, but is very prudent fi financially, but um, uh, that's, those numbers are, are, are taken, taken into consideration. The increases and the agreements that we anticipate uh, uh, with um, TALB and CSEA, I think, uh, is included as well. And to decrease from 435, call it 436 million this year to 260.9, million dollars in 26 27 we've just got to make adjustments and so once again we're trying to be transparent we're saying these are our goals these are the things we're looking for these are the things we're trying to do to uh, it, to, to implement our equity and excellence policy and um yet we got to pay for it um i i can somebody tell me how many uh, dollars in ESSER funds uh, we, ha we, we got originally. Does anybody know that? A, a total of almost around $500 million yeah. that we have allocated over a three-year period of time, right. which has been described to the public in the Learning Acceleration and Support Plan. Right. And, All and those funds expire, have to be encumbered September. by September. Yeah, That's right, so, this September. So the $550 million that we have, and by the way, we've spent a lot of those uh, monies, uh, and, and that's to our credit, but they're gone. And uh, there's no, we can't reach back and pull m money from those funds. Likewise, we have state pandemic uh, funds that have come in that are also uh, going away. We are work you know there's, there's ways I, I shouldn't say this too loud but what we're trying to do is to get that extended so that we can spend those monies by the end of the year instead of uh, uh having to have spent them all by the end of september and uh, that's just prudent fiscal management but uh, uh this is a different picture than we've seen and uh, it's causing us to have to make uh, tough decisions it's not fun to make those decisions, and we try and get as much information as possible from our staff and uh, at the state level and at the federal level uh, to make those decisions. But uh, uh, I'm confident that we're doing a good job. Thank you. Um, any further discussion on, on the budget? You know, uh, we were talking about uh, the outreach or the community engagement. I wish there was a website that people could go to, but I can't remember it. Can, can somebody help me out? I wish James, James, I, I can't James. remember the website. Uh, let me refresh your memory. www.lbschools.net slash 
L-C-A-P. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I feel like they had an arrangement or something. Okay, then it sounds like we're ready to move on um, on the agenda to our uh, to new business, and we have board policy. Excuse me. The um. board policy five one two one grades and evaluation of student achievement, and this is an information item, but I believe we have. Okay. I'm not going to go by the names I have on my list because the people who are showing up at the podium are not the names I have on my list. So I will not call you by somebody else's Is name. Dr. No, that's Dr. Camerino. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, uh, the roles have turned. I want to thank uh, Mr. Moskovitz for starting off at our February 20th board workshop on uh, the grading policy. Uh, and now we're switched roles, unfortunately. So he's here now. And, I mean, he's not here now, but I'm in, in, in position to go over the items that were discussed on February 20th. Uh, to the point that I appreciate that he mentioned in consideration of our equitable grading policy, equitable grading in Long Beach Unified School District, we talked about a little bit about the system portrait, creating an equal system for our, our, our students. Also looking at our adult portrait and, and looking at adaptable and reflective lifelong learners that he mentioned a bit. And more importantly, even the Vision 2035 strategic plan of removing the barriers for our students. And I know he quoted uh, Dr. Benitez about reflection is not enough, but we need action. And I think one of the things that we talk about that's really important is the disrupting the inequities in our system and really the moral imperative of our work, right? That's one of the things that we've talked about heavily when we talk about the work that we do in our level offices of what is mine to do as a teacher, whether I'm in kindergarten, third grade, seventh grade, or a high school teacher. And really when we think about grading, it really touches upon the board and superintendent goals that are super important in being able to know that our grades play huge uh, into college and career ready indicators. Our grades play into our A through G rates. Our, our grades play into in our middle schools when you think about access to some of our pathways. So those grades are really important. So the work that we're doing now uh, and that we're looking at that we introduced is our ex excellence and equity in the purpose of sharing the, the equitable grading board uh, grading for you all is grounded in the ex excellence and equity policy. And I know uh, Mr. Moskovitz had Dr. Benitez read the paragraph here, but really important is that last sentence where we say, as a large educational system, we are responsible for and committed to identifying and rectifying any harmful institutional, historical, or systemic practices. So really in the work that we are doing here today, I really want to applaud again, I have the first five slides of going over the information that a lot of you saw on February 20th, but more importantly too, in our timeline of the work, I'm sorry, let me go back, sorry, I'm going the wrong way of the work that uh, the team has done here, Mr. Madrigal, Mr. Cruz, and Dr. Chandrasekhar, and the work that we've done with our teaching staff, and if you look at the timeline that you all saw again on February 20th, just as a reminder, when we look at the numbers of our teachers that were involved in this process too, along with the fact that we've been looking at our ABC rates, it's a more positive look than seeing our DF rates, right? We're looking at our ABC rates now in a more positive way. It's something that we were doing pre-pandemic. It's one of the things that we talked about when we did our site visits, as we did our CIVs to QCVs and all the work that we've done with our sites. The sites have had information and data on what our A through C rates have been with our schools by department, by teacher, by pathway, by grade level. We've seen those all over and communicated. So we wanna just touch on the fact that we've had a lot of teacher input. We've had many teachers either come in through a teacher focus group, uh, either or draft a grading policy feedback group, equitable grading survey. Uh, we've had at least, to our numbers here now, at least 556 teachers giving input, which round comes out to about at least 46%. Now, some of these groups that were a part of giving input may have not done one of these sections or another, or they could be duplicate numbers. So we know for sure that at least 46% of our secondary teachers have had input into what we've done here with the grading policy. So wanted to remind everybody of the work that we've done there. So I am going to, uh, with that work, pass off the next component to Mr. Madrigal, as he's gonna come up and go over some of the items for the, for the policy. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Camarino. Good evening, uh, President Craighead. A board member, senior team, and our broader Long Beach Unified School District community. Thank you for having us back to continue our conversation as it relates to the uh, proposed grading policy. 
I hope you had uh, the opportunity uh, to detail the proposed grading policy and Joe Feldman's grading for equity book you were provided during our time together uh, two weeks ago. Please allow me the opportunity to turn back the clock to December 1st, 2021. 2021, good year, uh, Mr. Suarez. Um, this was a significant date for the Long Beach Unified School District. It is a date in which our board adopted the excellence and equity policy and the commitment to authentic continuous improvement, the commitment to address institutional, historical, and systemic harms, and in turn, develop transformative practices that promote successful outcomes for all student groups in the school district. This grading policy makes a great stride in that core belief that has paved the way for many other initiatives uh, for our district. The quote in front of you is from the Grading for Equity book, and it calls out the need for our current grading system to be examined and reimagined. The foundation of the grading policy and grading guidelines were created over a two-year process with input and feedback from students, parents, teachers, and administrators so that students can benefit from a more transparent, consistent, and fair approach to assessment and grading. The ideals that equitable grading practices are mathematically accurate, grading practices that are bias resistant and grounded in fairness, grading practices that help motivate students with clear guidelines, equitable grading practices that challenge students to learn from their highs and lows throughout their academic journey. At this time, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Viva Mogi to provide some clarity on board policy five, uh, 5121 you have been provided for review. Thank you. Um, in the board agenda and also in your board uh, packet, you had had you have two board policies in there. Um, one is just an updated version. And so if you can refer and also now on your table, you should see one that says draft proposed new policy and it should be highlighted in yellow as well. Um, just to clarify this, the, the one that is highlighted in yellow is um, an it was submitted at the time, but it was it's to show that there was an update as af after I received some feedback from the policy and business advisory group with the two of the board members. Um, the first paragraph, just briefly, is a framing around, as Mr. Madrigal spoke and, um, and others have spoke around the excellence and equity policy. Um, and also the second part is to, and Mr. Madrigal will get more into it about um, the students' um, grade should just not be on academic performance, but also learning and mastery. And um, the second part is around around the um, uniform grading and reporting guidelines, just to define what guidelines are. And then there are some components in there to make um, some of this, the our statements and um, how we're referring to our students to be gender neutral. And lastly, the last feedback we received was on the having subtitles in each of the pol um, in each of the sections to make sure that there's clarity for the public and others so as they read along that this is a new kind of section. And so those are kind of those are the additions that the change that you'll see from the first draft and the second draft. And I'll just pass it on so that they can talk actually more on the content matter of the policy. Thank you, Ms. Mogi. The following are key themes of the board policy. The expectation that all teachers at the secondary level shall follow the Long Beach Unified School District uniform grading and reporting guidelines. The guidelines provide cohesion and alignment on grading practices across the district. The need for communication. Parents and guardians and students have the right to receive course grades that represent an accurate evaluation of the student's learning, mastery, and overall academic performance. Teachers shall inform students and parent guardians of how academic performance will be evaluated in the classroom. Academic performance. 
a teacher shall base a student's grade solely on the quality of the student's academic work and their mastery of course content-based content and district standards. Students shall have the opportunity to demonstrate their ma this mastery through a variety of methods, including but not limited to tests, projects, portfolios, and their class discussion as appropriate. Other elements that are not a direct measure of knowledge and understanding of course content, such as attendance, effort, student conduct, and work habits shall not be factored into the academic grade, but may, may be reported separately. In the subject of missing assignments, whenever a student misses an assignment or assessment due to either an, a, 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 an excuse or unexcused absence, they shall be given full credit or subsequent satisfactory completion of the assignment or assessment. It is important, it is important to highlight that Education Code 49066 calls out that a grade assigned by the teacher shall not be changed by the board or the superintendent except as provided by law, board policy or administrative regulations guidelines. I am going to invite my colleague, Mr. Eddie Cruz, to join us in discussing the uniform grading and reporting guidelines. Good evening, uh, board and executive team. Um, I'm, I wanna apologize, I was out sick on for the board workshop on the 20th, um, but here we are. So thank you. I'm going to report on uh, the uniform grading and uh, reporting guidelines. The grading and reporting guidelines set the stage for consistent district-wide equitable grading practices. They will also ensure that students' grades are based on student achievement, knowledge, and skill. Students will receive formative, ongoing, credible, useful, and timely feedback. The grading policies will be transparent for our families and our students. Students will be provided multiple opportunities to demonstrate content and skill proficiency as well. The grading and reporting guidelines will encourage and guide students to assess and monitor their own learning. Some key themes of uniform grading and reporting guidelines. Communication, the course syllabus posted communicating departmental grading policies to students and parents, retakes and revisions, opportunities provided to demonstrate improved proficiency for our students, late work, assignments accepted to, the docu to document student learning and the grade shall be included in the grade book, makeup work, full credit for satisfactory completion of assignment or assessment after absence. As Feldman points out with this quote, the goal of retakes is to give students another chance at proving their mastery. Knowing of this opportunity will result in a decrease of student stress over academics. Thank you. Good evening, board member Craighead, board members, and senior team. Um, thank you for having us back again. Um, we're really excited to kind of share this with you. It's been a long time coming. Um, just a quick question. Did you all know there was a quiz today to check mastery of content? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I had to kind of bring that in. The teacher in me comes out, so I apologize for that. Um, but what we want to kind of share is the key themes of the uniform grading um, guidelines. This is entrenched. It's, the foundation is the students and their success. It's about the equity and the excellence policy talks about the students, what they need, how we can support them. And the reference has been made in various um, uh, various people have made references to that today. So one of the things that I want to kind of, before I go into this, is these are practices, and as Dr. Camarino said, a lot of teachers are already doing these things. They are, you know, they are kind of using these practices. But it, the one, what we're trying to do now is make it uniform across the district. Because we have parents who have said, and students who have said, that at the same time, 
uh, at the same site, they have differences between teachers. So with the uniform guidelines, the intent is that every student has the equ has equal opportunities, no matter which schools, uh, which school or grade level they go to. So starting with the grading design, the first part is separating the grades from behavior. A lot of times it's um, ensuring that the students are looking at the content, they're mastering the content, and it's not based on conduct. And a lot of times we've found that um, students really try hard, and sometimes it's like it's called point gathering. I get points for coming on time, I get points for turning things in, but that doesn't necessarily bring about the mastery of the content. So with the guidelines, the whole fo focus is that it's not going about, it's not about work habits, but it's about the content. The second part, this is kind of something that's um, brought about a lot of discussions, great discussions, I have to say, especially with our teachers who are part of the book study. And we had teachers who kind of said, um, we need to kind of make sure that um, about the traditional grading scale. When we look at the failing grade, it's a six band of grades. And it's not equitable to the other A, B, C, D grades, which are at, um, 10%, uh, 10, uh, are equal. So the focus is that the recommendation is to kind of say the F, the lowest, needs to be a 50%. And it's equal to, it's mathematically equal to um, all the other grade bands. And it's not about, it's all about making sure that the students have a real, uh, have real chances to kind of succeed. If, you, if the teachers are using the traditional 0 to 100 traditional grade scales, then 50 would be the lowest. They also have the option of using a five-point scale, which goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So just looking at what's mathematically sound and gives the students a fair chance. There's, there's been a lot of conversations around the missing assignments because um, there is and the teachers feel that the students who put in the effort, turn the work in, they need to kind of be differentiated from the students who never turn anything in. So one of the recommendations was that if a student at the end of the grading period has um, missing assignments, then they should be given a 45% because it is a smaller hill to climb than trying to go from a zero to um, a decent grade, uh, like a passing grade. So the recommendation is that it would be at 45%. This is something that we kind of talk about, the zero to um, 100 scale. It kind of focuses on failure when it looks at the F, instead of helping the students have a growth mindset and say, okay, I messed up, I didn't get the grades, but at least if I get if I have like a fighting chance, I can make up my grades, giving them, and a lot of times if the students are failing, they lose their motivation. And if you remember in the first few slides that Mr. Madrigal talked about, is about motivating the students. If they've already kind of got really low grades, there is no motivation for them to come up. So it's a case of how do we kind of keep them striving and having a growth mindset. So this is something. Um, what I want to show is um, these slides when we to kind of talk about the um, slides that, we, that when we talked about the 45 for a missing. If you look at the top part, I guess I can't show, use the laser. But if you look at the um, zero for missing when that student went from a 45.55% is now when they change the missing to 45%, they have a D instead of an F. It gives them motivation to kind of say, okay, I can try and bring my grades up. So that is one of the pieces. If you look at the second slide, it's another example of the same thing. Changing it from a zero to a 45% for, uh, for missing gives the students hope. And what we need to focus on is hope versus fear. We need to kind of give them a chance to succeed and give them the option to be successful. Um, when I think of the student, Stephanie from Browning, 
the joy in her face, the joy in her expressions when she talked about graduating. That's we, what we want for each and every student in our district. That's what we want for our graduates. And it doesn't have to be high school graduates. That's what we want for our students as they go through uh, our school system. So I'm going to hand, uh, hand it back to Mr. Madrigo to kind of talk about our next steps. Thank you, Dr. Trendesekar. So uh, board, uh, the, the timeline that you see here is the proposed timeline with the thought of we have 60 plus days left in the school year and <laughs> and and the need the need for us to uh, hear uh, teachers administrators as to how we go ahead and um, create a plan create a plan in which this year we're able to plan ahead for the 24-25 school year and and accurately implement the supports needed so that they're timely uh, timely supports so that we can also um, engage our parent community engage our students as to how this is going to feel different land different and hopefully encourage our students uh, differently into next school year. So uh, the last time that we were, we were here with you on uh, February the 20th, we mentioned to you that uh, Chris Itson and team is ready to create videos. We have some big plans on how to involve uh, students in the delivery, making sure that we have student voice in that. So at this time, I'd like to open it up to any questions, and I welcome our senior team to also weigh in on how we envision uh, this rolling out into next year. I do have a question, Mr. Madrigal. Um, in June 2023, teachers, secondary uh, teachers were surveyed approximately roughly how many I know dr. Camarino stated that uh, about 46 percent gave input my questions more how many were surveyed roughly it was 556 responses that were and it was sent to all teachers of how many of roughly how many teachers so we had about 500 or roughly how many teachers 1200 and um, so with this, um, with this new policy, so in A, would that still constitute a 90 to 100 percent? Yes. Um, I get that, Dr. Lund? OK. Um, yes. The policy states that the superintendent or designee shall establish a uniform grading system. Who would that designee be? Who's going to, because the policy doesn't uh, give any details as to what this is going to look like. Yeah, the guidelines that have been shared tonight will be placed into administrative regulations. So when you all make a policy, it doesn't tell how it will be implemented. The information that's been shared, that's been developed, with all of the kinds of input that you're talking that you have heard about, will be put into the administrative regulations or guidelines um, to the to the question. And who will the designee be? The staff that's been working on this. Yeah, the team that's been working on this. Okay, and um, has the district taken into account the coherence uh, with colleges and universities in this? And then I guess I definitely have another question. So that means that also um, unexcused absences, kids would give, get full credit, which you know, I definitely see that point, but I guess my question would then be, what is the incentive for students to attend class? What is the incentive for them to submit projects on time if um, they can wait until the very last minute? And, and then how fair is that to the, to the classroom teacher who then has to grade all those uh, projects or uh, assignments to, uh, to give that student a, a grade? 
I, I will say that 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 was a con that has been and will continue to be a conversation amongst teachers, whether it be in the focus group, uh, book study, but with the understanding that we have students that do have instances in which life happens and we have to be able to support them with those challenges. And that's why we ask for our teams, whether it be at the school site as departments, to discuss and calibrate how we are going to have that standard across the board instead of there being no standard at the moment and it really being a, I hate to call it a luck of the draw, I want to make sure that we, we understand that it shouldn't be by chance that a student is in a classroom with a teacher that is equitably grounded as opposed to it being by design in saying together we've created this system as a safeguard for students and teachers to assist in that regard. And then I know this policy doesn't include it, but um, it does state that the superintendent or the board couldn't make that change completely agree uh, on a letter grade, but it does also doesn't uh, give power to the teachers who may have inaccurately added a grade in the system um, and then can go in and make that change. Mm -hmm. Are you asking if a teacher can change their grade? Yes, their because it's grade. not included on here. There's, there's actually education code that guides that for us, so it's not in the policy itself. I don't know if it's in the list of references, um, perhaps to the policy. Um, the education code that you're referring to is the second to last paragraph in the board policy. Okay, thank you, Viva. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Madrigal and the entire team. So I, I applaud um, this bold proposal for a policy. Uh, ultimately for me, and I shared this at the board meeting, but I'll share it again here since not all the millions of people that watch these meetings mm -hmm. watch the board uh, meeting, meeting. If our goal as an educational system is to ensure the highest levels of learning and understanding and mastery, if that's our goal. And it's all over our graduate portrait, right? The kinds of students that we want to support. Then in order to do that, let's be very frank, Mr. Madrigal. Mm -hmm. like, you, you, you're in a tough position to say it, but I'll say it. Uh, we don't currently have transparency on, in some cases, What's an A? What, this wasn't in the syllabus. Well, how many assignments this? What happens if I don't turn in this on time? So it's not about giving freebies. It's not about inflating grades. It's about ensuring that we're transparent in what we're going to use to measure academic performance. Additionally, it's about being consistent. So it shouldn't matter whose class I'm in and for students to say, oh, you got lucky. Your teacher lets you make up work, whether it's an excused or unexcused absence. My teacher doesn't, right? It's about consistency. Mm -hmm. Because the word on the street that we hear from our students all the time is, oh, you got the unfair teacher. So it leads me to the third one. It's about being fair, right? So if we're gonna talk about A through G completion, if we're gonna talk about the disproportionate number of black and Latinx students not getting those A, Bs, and Cs, uh, Dr. Camarino. I like the asset-based, uh, right, uh, and strength-based approach. Then we have to have uniformity, consistency, transparency, and fairness, right? How is it that in one class, you can make up a missing assignment by, by doing 10 extra credit assignments that do nothing potentially to enhance learning or measure academic performance. But in another class, there's no makeups. Mm -hmm. So do we want to be the district that keeps punishing, keeps harming,
keeps destroying the hopes and dreams of our most vulnerable students, or do we want to fix, reconcile, mitigate the harm that we're doing? Because for that student that started off our meeting tonight, that said, I am going to get an AA degree and graduate, uh, guess what? We have a Long Beach Promise, Dr. Baker. A Long Beach Promise that it's harder to get into certain CSUs, it's harder to get into certain UCs and get that GPA. So it behooves us as a system to ensure that our students can compete, can compete with the very best, the very best, the brightest, get that AA, graduate from our system and know that they're learning and mastering not that their grade was left in the hands of an arbitrary, ununiform, or non-uniform, untransparent, opaque maybe, unfair grade in a class that could literally wipe out the hopes and dreams. That one class that gets you off A through G track determines the possibilities for that student. And so I applaud our district for taking this huge leap. It's not easy, we need, we need the implementation of it. We'll continue, what I'm hearing, we'll continue listening to students, mm -hmm. to teachers, to parents. It's not a one size fits all. It's not a decree that we're dictating how you measure learning and mastery. It's about those three things that we started off with, right? It's about transparency, <coughs> consistency, and fairness at the end of the day. So I'm looking forward to uh, us considering this for uh, action uh, at a future meeting. Thank you, Dr. Bernitas. Thank you. Any more comments? Oh, good, Axel. <laughs> I was almost going to call on you because, <laughs> really? yes, because as a student, you have a unique perspective, and that's why we have you here. So happy to see you weigh in. <laughs> Um, I would just first like to ask, what would be the impact that this grading policy would have on students? That's a great question. And um, student board member uh, Axel Aguilar, I know that you were a part of the RSVP uh, Zoom session with my colleague Eddie Cruz here. And I know that there was a lot of questions around how is this going to be normed in yeah. general? and. One of the things that we know is that by enacting this, this, uh, this policy, we have to keep an eye on how it is assisting and supporting students. And that's why it's important for us to come back to the table and continue these conversations so that we can ensure that what it's trying to do, it will do. Okay. So you're asking how is this going to impact or help students? Those visuals that Dr. Chandra Sekar uh, put up there show how you have a struggling student and with this modification, it's supporting them. Now, obviously, students still have to do the work. Mm -hmm. that's, that, that's a piece of it, okay? So you, it's, not, it's not they're getting a freebie, you did the work and they did it and they also get, it's not that. They still have to do the work. They have to show mastery behind it a high achieving student will continue to be a high achieving student regardless whether this gets uh, uh, passed or not. Okay, and then uh, a lot of the students in that same RSVP meeting had uh, a lot of profound opinions on the grading policy. So I would just like to ask, have there been any changes or any uh, inclusion of those opinions within this draft of the policy? So the policy uh, as it stands, you heard our, our, my colleague here, uh, Viva Mogi, there was some modifications to the actual policy itself. In terms of the actual guidelines, based on the feedback that has been received, so close to the end of the deadline here where n nothing drastic was, was changed. But our goal is to continue to engage with students so that we can make it a, a, a policy that it's for students, by students, by listening to your voice and seeing exactly how it's landing across all of our school sites. It's gonna land differently at the middle school level, it's gonna land differently at the, at the high school level, but the key is 
as you as you heard earlier, we have a lot of schools, we have a lot of teachers that are already doing, um, are implementing these policies. Now it's a matter of making sure that everyone gets that same opportunity across our schools. Student board member Axel, um, what was the overall like students? How how are they feeling about this policy? Uh, so, my general. Uh, like some summation of what the students thought was that it might have been a little bit too lenient on the students, uh, um, that it was giving students a freebie, and that students were able that students were able to take advantage of the policy and end up as the same as students who are high achieving and complete their assignments on time and then turn their things regularly. That those students who were not as consistent were able to make everything up towards the end and that's where it, like the nuances of that it was huge and they weren't uh, they didn't agree with that part of the policy actually I sat I sat in on that meeting too and I will say that our students have really high expectations of themselves and considering the group that's part of you know the RSVP they're high achieving students with but also remembering that a lot of our students in our system aren't in that place yeah. uh, for whatever reason, right? So we wanna make sure, as you asked, what is the impact of this with our students? For the majority of our students that are maybe not at A through G right now or not meeting some of the standards that we know, and as you see the data, m largely our black and brown students aren't meeting A through G, it's giving our students hope, mm -hmm. right? Our, our, like, like Mr. Madrigal said earlier, our high achieving students, this is just gonna be something that's gonna just, you're gonna move forward on this. It's not really gonna impact you, but really it's gonna be consistent within our classes and our school and our systems that will give our students, especially our black and brown students, hope, not give them higher grades, but a hope to improve their grades. So let me, I wanna make sure we're very clear with that. The guidelines are really helping them set themselves up for, obviously if you continue to have missing assignments, missing assignments, there's nothing that's gonna be able mathematically, it's not gonna help you improve your grade, but it's gonna give you that hope that there's still a chance of those, especially those critical assignments where we hope that this is gonna uh, prompt that conversation of teachers and students having conversation of, I've missed this work because, and saying, hey, Mr. Suarez or Jim, I'm your teacher. These assignments are missing, what's going on? And I get to know the story of why Jim is missing those assignments as the teacher, to have that connection and collaboration of Jim all of a sudden saying, oh, this teacher really asked me about what my grade is or what I'm doing. I'm gonna do more work because the teacher cared and asked about it, right? So those are the conversations that we're really prompting with the guidelines. Can I ask you a, a follow-up question? So actually, that was a great, uh, thank you for sharing uh, that. Hey, hey uh, Dr. Camarino, come, come on up. Come on up. <laughs> I, I wanna run with that a little bit. This is, sure. this is great, right? This, this is why this is an information item uh, right now. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing here is two things. Uh, and, if, and you're welcome to share. I was going to ask you if you want to provide an example. So thank you for the question, uh, Board Member Lopez. Uh, I'm hearing two things. One is I'm hearing that we need to educate our students, particularly our high achieving students, how this doesn't dismiss or undervalue the hard work that's involved, the effort that's involved in getting things in on time, in trying your very best. But that's not mutually exclusive of the hope that you talked about. So part of this is, um, you know, what's the word on the street, Axel, that you're telling us? The word on the street for high achieving students is that somehow it undervalues the effort, right? And, 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 and the content knowledge that's involved. I think the other piece of this is, and th this is where the nuances come in, uh, Dr. Baker, if I'm, if I'm understanding the, what was shared uh, uh, and, and you're sharing now, uh, Axel, and I, this is the part that I'm hoping that we can uh, talk through uh, tonight. Um, there is a technical piece to this as well, uh, right? And, and it has to do, I think, more with the administrative regulations around, um, love the example, uh, Axel. Um, what, do, what, do, what, do, what are teachers going to provide, right, uh, in order to you know, give hope to those students that are at that 45% while, while uh, not dismissing the effort, right, that our Yale going students uh, are gonna be putting in because, because it, it, it's actually 
juxtaposing and pitting potentially um, our highest achieving students against those that real or perceived may be seen as getting a freebie. I, I, I love the honesty. All right, so there's a technical aspect to this. So could you speak a little bit uh, about that? I, I told a story earlier uh, uh, to our principals too. At our, we had our high school principals meeting today. Uh, we were visiting pre-pandemic one of our high schools and a teacher that's very popular among students uh, gets teacher recognition of the year all the time is pro students and, and, and we know we had a, one of our visits where I, Dr. Baker was actually in the room too as we were visiting and she made an outburst of, oh my gosh, I am hurting the kids that I care for so much because of the way I weight my grades. A teacher that is known at this high school, very recognizable, very popular, all about students realized that her own way, but as we were talking about the A through C rates and how to weight grades and assignments and how do we, that she realized as a person who was pro student, she was actually hurting her own students of having her door open, makeup test anytime, come on over, still had a decently high or low A, A through C rate because of the way she weighted her grades. So this is part of why the grading guidelines are gonna help us have a dialogue of being able to have those thresholds of what is really acceptable on critical assignments especially, right? So the critical assignments of, we can go back and forth on talking about if in my unit assessment that I'm gonna have at the end of the first quarter, I got a D on. But later on, maybe just before the semester's over, I've understood the concept. Can I take that back and say, hey, I can now ace this test because I know it now? Is it because it's too late? I should have learned it at the first quarter? Those are the conversations we need to have. Is it about what I know or is it because I didn't know it on October 15th, but I know it on December 13th, right? So those are the conversations that we need to have and be able to say, is learning happening maybe a little bit slower for me because I didn't get it at the time for whatever reason? Those are the conversations that we really wanna have. And again, not to minimize the work that we have with our high achieving students, but the other work of it too becomes, as you know, with high achieving students, it becomes kind of a gameplay of how do I do these things? And, and, and to your point, you mentioned extra credit or the things that I want to do to be able to have and maintain that A. But again, even some assignments that hurt our students, sometimes our students are stuck at that B and that causes a lot of stress in our system of not being able to achieve that A because of some, some of the thresholds that are so strict on not being able to have these uh, opportunities and conversations with our students and our, and our parents. Can I push you and the team, uh, Dr. Camarino? That, that's all fine and dandy. I think you're picking easy examples uh, first. Okay. So I'm going to call in the team here, who at one point or another, most of you, if not all of you, were in the classroom yourselves. What I, what I want to get at here is, and this is a big piece, uh, so this is a big piece. Um, consciously or not, we perpetuate things like ableism and implicit bias in the classroom when we give credit to things like participation, mm. right? Because then it becomes on who gets called on when five or six students raise their hand or is raising hand indicator of learning and mastery, right? Um, are we gonna punish students that haven't built up the confidence yet, that don't have the hope by not giving them credit for not participating when they could full well, full well demonstrate learning, mastery, academic performance through other more equitable measures, right? So can, can we talk about that team? Because th this is, again, the hidden, the implicit bias, all the things that we're trying to undo with our excellence and equity policy gets anchored at the end of the day, it's a grade, right? It's a percentage point, right? That determines what your pathways to success may or may not be. So I wanna call in the team here because this is our opportunity, right? And the education piece is absolutely still necessary, but there are real concrete pedagogical implications uh, for this. I don't want to speak for teachers, but I want to go back to a place that Mr. Madrigal started and anchored and that we've heard a couple of different times, and that is anchored in the excellence and equity policy. This is an example of the pairing of excellence and equity at the policy level. That is holding the highest standards for all students. An A is an A is an A. 
it is not competing against a student who needs a different set of resources and something like a 45% credit for a late assignment. So when we think about what that policy requires of us, it is dismantling things that have harmed black and brown students, students with disabilities, and English learners at the policy level. And so there are lots of opinions about how to go about implementing the policy that we should be listening to students and taking into consideration the communication. But an A student like student board member Aguilar, who's recently interviewed with Yale University, will not be harmed by a student. And if you could go back to the slide that shows the percentage change grade with 0% for missing, grade with 45% for missing. That is, this is not Axel. This is a student who may be experiencing tremendous difficulties in learning, in their life experiences, in a family illness, in all of the things that impact our students. That same student is not competing against Axel. Axel will reach the highest standards because of the, he gets what he needs and has what he needs. And a student who traditionally, when you look at these two um, differences, a grade with 0% per for missing takes a student straight to failure with no room or no opportunity to show mastery with the 45% doesn't take them to an A. It takes them to a passing grade. They are not competing with Axel. They are giving an op given an opportunity, and the word has been used, which we often say, hope is not a strategy. But having hope, if you are a student, a black or brown student, who is at risk of tremendous failure, to have hope that you can get to a passing grade is really important and represents the board policy that was passed in December of 2021 around excellence and equity combined, not separate combined as a high standard and ensuring that students with different needs have the way forward in a policy. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baker. And that zero and that 45 is still an F, right? It's still not, they're, they're not getting full credit. They're still getting an F, but it gives them hope mathematically to still be able to pass or move on in the classroom. So I do have a question, another question. Um, so if a student, now let's say, a student is striving to earn straight A's and they don't do well on a project or an assessment. Can they retake it as many times turn that turn that A? Well, the, the, policy, the guidelines which it would, would go into having an opportunity and it only states the one, right? The opportunity to make up that assessment or exam. We would hope that that student will still have a chance, especially when you think of the historical, this student is an A student and all of a sudden didn't get one. I would hope that he or she would have an opportunity, again, with our policy in, in mind, because part of the conversation is, as our students who, whether they're trying to strive for that A, because they missed an assignment or failed an assignment, whatever it was, or a student that's trying to get a D because they have fails, well, they have advocates of teachers, counselors, and administrators that say, I wish I could help you, but there's really nothing that I can ground my and support you with that certain grade that you have in that certain class. This would help us have a little bit more of a discussion of not just about the equity policy, but our grading policy that we can go into having conversations and giving that student hope. There's been many times where a lot of our students have gone to their teacher that they feel comfortable with to say, can you help me in this class because I did X, Y, or Z. So those are the pieces that, again, help us give a calibration. I think it helps calibrate our secondary schools and to be able to understand that grades mean something, right, to Dr. Benitez's point of A through G, future prospects, am I going to be college and career ready? It really gives everyone that hope, including our students who are getting all A's, because you mentioned, if they're getting all A's and they didn't get an A on an assignment. They can, so the answer is yes, they can retake correct. it to try to strive to get those straight A's if, you know, for our high achieving students as well. So then my following question is, how are we gonna support them, the teachers? I'm gonna go right back to the teachers right. uh, who are going to now have to find time to make up those tests, to grade those assignments whenever they come in. Uh, what is the plan to support them? I, without, you know, Dr. Madri, Mr. Madri, I could go into some of that conversation, but I can tell you from having site experience, Many, 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 I would say 98% of our teachers have always said, all of them, 
I have dates and times where students can make up any time, full credit. I have not heard any teacher ever not say that I'm not available on this day, my conference period, and open up their doors for an assignment that's critical, an assessment that's critical. They've opened their doors and now aligning it with what they've said to us. And I, you can speak to some of the conversations that were probably had in the-, in the I studio. definitely understand Dr. Camarino. I've worked with students. Mm -hmm. However, it is very different to accommodate for a few students and to accommodate for all students, which by the way, I think, you know, if this is gonna help us, sounds like it's definitely gonna help us graduate more students mm -hmm. and get them, you know, uh, uh, to a better place beyond high school. Uh, but again, this is, you know, we are talking about all the students versus accommodating for a few students. But wait, it, let's say your situation happens. Wouldn't that be an awesome classroom to be a part of where all the students wanna work really hard to get an A? So if, so if we have that problem, then dang it, I think we're in a good spot. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And, and that's what I'm saying. But I mean, we definitely have to also think of the teachers who are, you know, now going to have to find time to grade all these assignments, make time to have these students retake exams. Board Member Lopez, uh, that, that, that has been an area of concern brought up by, by teachers during our book study, our focus group. But the feedback that they've given and the feedback that they have provided to the guidelines, the guideline document that has been created, is making sure that we are clear with students how they could go about doing that. Making sure that at the school level, departments are able to establish norms as opposed to, again, allowing some students out of school and others not having that same opportunity. So it's clarity, ensuring that the syllabi that go out at the beginning of the year clearly state when teachers are able to, when they've agreed to allow students to do so, and definitely not wait to the last minute, not wait until the week before grades are due. So that's something that I, I Again, in, in honoring uh, teacher voice, that's, the, that's one of the areas that I wanna make sure is clear that it's about, cl it's clarity to students, parents, so that all of our students can have the same uh, playing, uh, equal playing field. Um, I love how this grading policy is setting up all students for an equal playing field, but my biggest concern is how this grading policy will set up students after high school because there's a big difference between high school grading policy and the, and the grading policy at colleges and universities. So my question is how will this impact the students going into college with this uh, grading policy like that they're used to? Like how would they be how would they transition from this policy into the next one? Like a culture change. Mm -hmm. yeah. Th thank you for that, that question. Now, for students that are currently not meeting those A through G requirements, I don't think college really is something that um, our system is currently assisting with getting them there. Uh, the lack of a policy, with a policy, it's giving them that fighting opportunity to be able to learn along the way from their mistakes. Uh, hopefully the triumphs that they do have in classrooms, they are able to begin applying that skill set so that they could see themselves at a Yale, at a Cal State Long Beach, at a Long Beach City, so that we're able to open that door for all of our students. hasn't been mentioned that I think could possibly be a benefit to this change in the policy is that I think the message that it can send to colleges and uh, postgraduate programs is that we have a transparent, consistent, and fair policy and they can rely on that. I think right now it's a, I'll use a uh, indelicate term, it's a crapshoot. You know, they, they, colleges say, well, how did they get to that? And uh, and we can gain a reputation. It won't be 
the first year, the second year, but if we can implement something that has those char characteristics, uh, it will be, I think, ultimately beneficial uh, and, and uh, do away with the gamesmanship. Thank you, Board Member Otto. Well, so the ultimate goal for me would still be for any college, university, uh, technical school, to say we want more LBUSD students here. We want your best and brightest. And for me, the grades are a component of that. But again, let's, let's be very clear. Grades are also uh, not the only indicator of success once you've gone to college, right? You still have to put in the work. You still got to turn in things. And, and so to me, the, 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 the aspirational goal is here still learning, mastery, academic performance that are not just applicable uh, to the college university experience that we all want students to have the opportunity to do, but it's those skill sets, problem solving, critical thinking uh, that they'll apply in any context, uh, including the university and college aspirations. So yeah, from a, from a CSU system, I want, I want all faculty and staff and administrators to say, send us more of these students, right? Because they are such um, high achieving uh, students and they were able to get in because they have the GPA uh, for the higher eligibility index that our local preference uh, school here has. Thank you, Dr. Benitez. Actually, I do want to address your question too and on the other side of it that you and I don't recognize, are those families that come from a lot of influence? They're not learning their way into colleges and universities in the way that they have influence from their families to get into graduate programs that you and I cannot get into because we don't have that influence. So on the opposite spectrum of what we see too, right, is that where is the balance of fairness when we have students who maybe in our demographic, are a little, we're giving them hope, but on the other side of the demographic that you and I never have seen in our lives, of the families that have influence politically or uh, regionally or state or nationally, their, their children seem to get into programs in spite of maybe that grading policy that we have too. So think about the other side of the coin of folks that have influence that are able to get those students through college universities that you will see when you, be, when you come to school too, you'll see that they have gotten into the schools because of sometimes family influence. Jay, that we won't speak about. Are those families that can pay to send their kids to private schools that Axel has to compete? Correct. With because those private schools have articulation agreements with private universities and colleges. Yeah, so I just want to share that, Axel. I just respectfully just want to share that with you too. I understand your high standard totally too. We, we definitely have the higher standard too. We just want to give our students hope of having, that they may not have seen it, right? Some of us may not be Yale material, but we maybe are at 19, 20, 21 years old, we could become Yale material. We want to just let everyone know everyone can be Yale material, no matter where in your spectrum of learning is going to happen. We want to give them that hope. Right, so some of them may not be able to. Maybe they're Yale after they go to City College. Maybe they go to work City College then Yale, right? So there's always that hope that we want to give all of our students. Because we don't have always Yale ready students at senior year. Maybe they're Yale ready later, later on. Okay. And if I could add something to that, Dr. Camarino. Uh, I had the pleasure earlier today to engage with parent facilitators. Um, and one of the presenters from the Bethune Center, uh, Shelby, she made us aware that we currently have 6,000 students in our system that are unhoused or identify as homeless. And while well, I mean, it's 6,000 of our students that have that hardship on a daily basis. And this grading policy really leans into them to help them um, better understand and for, for teachers to better understand how we can support um, students that are really struggling to just show up to school on a daily basis. Well, I want to thank everybody for this um, discussion. I think it's been very productive. I love hearing um, both sides of everything. Um, I think one thing I, I just want to um, uplift is the idea that this new grading policy will encourage more interaction between teachers and students. And I think that for students to feel respected by their teachers in such a way or 
for students to hear from their teacher that they, that they care, that they're interested in why an assignment was missing or maybe why they weren't able to do something. I think that's gonna go a long way. Um, but I do appreciate all the work that's gone into this. I appreciate how our <coughs> excellence and equity policy is a living document in that we are tying in um, everything from our, our, our grading policy to uh, communications, parent in, involvement. Everything is tied to that excellence and equity policy <clears throat> that exists, that lives in, in other policies so that we can break down systems to level the playing field. And we see this in, um, in a lot of the work that's being done. So I wanna um, you know, thank the team, Dr. Camarino, Mr. Madrigal, Mr. Cruz, Vanita, I was gonna try and pronounce your last name. I don't think I can ever do it correctly, so Dr. Vanita, it's gonna have to be. But um, unless there's anything else on this um, topic, then we will move on to um, uh, board member reports and announcements, and Axel, we'll start with you, and I'm hoping that you're gonna include something about this Yale thing because people are dropping Yale here and there and I think we need to hear about that. Well, as far as Yale, I've, all I've gotten was an interview so I don't hear back until March 28th. But as far as my board report, I would like to thank Janice Hahn for contributing a $10,000 donation to Jordan High School's co uh, chorus performance at Carnegie Hall in New York City. Um, I would also like to wish my Panthers and the Panther Band the best of luck at their New York trip this Saturday, hoping they have a really wonderful time in New York City, and that is something that I wish everyone else can enjoy too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Yeah, well, I'll try and be, be try and be brief. It's getting late here. Um, well, first off, uh, yesterday was a big day for uh, our county. It was election day, and so uh, with the our elections, uh, we have obviously aligned our city elections with the county elections, and we've also expanded the process where now you can vote over. I think it's 10 days. Is it a total of 10 days? Uh, regardless, uh, it, it, we expanded the opportunities for people to go out and vote. And to do so, uh, it has required uh, the county to do a lot of work to make that process possible and accessible for everyone. And so I just wanted to send a big shout out to all of those county workers and all of those poll workers uh, who assisted in that process as um, those were some long days. It was a lot of work. And uh, I know for our democratic process, uh, it is an important one. So uh, we just, I just wanted to make sure that I uh, gave them uh, their kudos uh, for their efforts in uh, supporting the election process. Uh, next, just talking about uh, some of our campuses. I want to give a big shout out to Poly Basketball. Uh, we obviously, um, have heard of all the great things that Poly has going on due to the celebrities who've come from that campus, to the great athletes who've come from that campus. Uh, uh, their uh, moniker of the home of scholars and champions is uh, never fallen short as every year uh, they're somewhere in the thick of things when it comes to the championship conversation. And uh, this year was... Uh, uh, just that, as they, uh, their basketball team uh, played an excellent season this year. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, that last game was a tough one. That was a, that was a tough one to watch, a heartbreaker. Uh, but I know that um, their coach and all of the players uh, worked really hard for this season. And so I just wanted to uh, congratulate them on a great season. And um, uh, obviously, I know some of them are got some big-time college opportunities going on and so just wanted to send my kudos to them and to the great season and great environment that they created. I know uh, both myself and uh, Maria were at the game and uh, I think we both were a little disappointed at the outcome uh, but it was it was a fun game and I can tell that everyone in attendance enjoyed it so um, big shout out to them. 
Uh, last but definitely not least, uh, I wanted to uh, thank uh, all of the folks over at Bobby Smith Elementary. They hosted a fantastic black history program. Uh, I think that was the 26th. Um, it was a lot of fun. They uh, acknowledged uh, the athletic director over at Polly, Miss Irving, for her contributions to uh, just athletics in our city, but also just all of her great achievements um, as a person. Uh, all things considered, uh, they had uh, the blues band playing, and uh, it was, once again, just one of those uh, moments where I felt very proud of the district that I represent because of uh, the way we showed up and showed out when it came to Black History Month. It, it, it didn't feel performative, but it felt very much uh, a value of black culture and its impact uh, on our greater community. And I couldn't be more pleased with the program that they uh, put on as uh, it was very much humbling. And so they had the mayor there. They had uh, a lot of city influencers there. And so it was uh, really, really cool. So I just wanted to make sure that I acknowledged my folks over at Bobby Smith for putting on such a great program. That's the end of my report. Yes, just two items, Madam Chair. Um, one, I wanted to give a big shout out uh, to all the folks that attended and participated and helped to organize our community partner convening last week. Uh, Dr. Brown. Uh, we had a packed house at Browning High School, uh, just uplifting and highlighting uh, how important our community partners to our educational endeavor. So uh, thank you uh, for our team uh, for organizing that and to all the community partners that came out and spent a nice breakfast morning engaging uh, and leveraging those partnerships and exploring opportunities uh, to do more. Uh, so, uh, and second, I am in the process of um, doing a two month plan to visit all the schools in my uh, area, in my district. Uh, I, was, I was brainstorming with Leticia today, Dr. Baker, do we call this Panecito con Juan, uh, Pan Dulce and Juan, but then I'm like, oh, then people are gonna be like, oh, only unhealthy, so maybe we do Fruta y Pan Dulce. Um, but in essence, uh, I'd love to check in with my school communities uh, at each of uh, the schools. Um, we sort of lock in a time where either at drop off uh, with students, students can you know come check in with me, share with them some of the priorities, but just check in, see how things are going at the school, anything they want to share with me, and I'm able to share, um, since not every single of the millions of persons uh, out there is, is watching our school board meetings. Uh, but please be on the lookout for all the schools in my area for some communication uh, from each of the schools once we coordinate good times where I can also meet with our educators um, uh, on each campus. So it'll be a mix between right before school, right after school, or maybe toward the end of the day. Uh, but I wanted to highlight that so that we could um, start coordinating uh, that. So we'll, we'll get that coordinated in the next week or so. And then um, I'm looking forward to engaging with our school communities at all the schools in District 3. Thank you. Pan dulce y fruta? Hmm. I'm going to look for an invitation. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Otto. So um, uh, two nights ago, we did the Wilson PTA uh, meeting, which was very, very fun and uh, educational. It's not the first time that I've been there, but this one was special. It, was, it ended with a... Um, uh, a question and answer um, period with, formed into two lines, and uh, and uh, questions were provided, and it was a way to get to know people. It was it was a lot of fun. Uh, I did want to tell everybody that I am going to go to the concert at Carnegie Hall in New York. I'm going to New York and will be there, and uh, I'm really looking forward to that. In fact, I've been trying to uh, get contacts with people that are coming from Jordan, and uh, I'm. It, it's a really, uh, it really will be a good thing. Um, and I, just to kind of hitchhike off of what um, uh, Eric said, uh, you know, yesterday was an election day uh, throughout the United States, here in California, and also in Long Beach. Um, 
my position as a school board member for Area 4, uh, the area that I live in, uh, was up for election and I was qualified as a candidate in early November uh, 2023. Uh, however, I did not have an opponent and therefore under California law, I was able, I, I am able to continue to serve another four years representing Area Ford on the Long Beach Unified School District Board of Education, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, this is hard work. It's about 15 hours a week. It also requires developing relationships, not only with my fellow board members, uh, with teachers and staff and my constituents, but it, it, uh, it takes uh, a real uh, dedicated uh, effort, and, uh, um, and I accept this responsibility uh, with open arms. I'm a proud Long Beach School District um, uh, product. Uh, they gave me a solid foundation for my post-Long Beach Unified School District education career, my career, um, my marriage to my spectacular wife, who uh, um, has meant so much. We have, we've had five kids and uh, nine grandchildren that, uh, uh, that uh, we think that Long Beach Unified was a big factor in all that. Um, I tell people regularly, and I think I've said it here many times, that um, <clears throat> the Long Beach Unified School District is, in my opinion, the glue that holds Long Beach together. Without it, it we would be a very, very different community, and it was made so evident when the pandemic was ongoing, and then afterwards when people would come to the meetings and you could just tell that we were trusted, that we were believed in, and the problems that many school districts close by here and further away are happening are not happening in Long Beach because of uh, that trust. So I'm honored to be a part of this uh, governing uh, board here, and uh, I'm looking forward to the next four years. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. Yes. So I visited uh, Grant Elementary School um, and was received uh, with a warm welcome. Um, by the office staff and the principal. And I want to thank uh, Ms. Solentino, the school principal, for taking the time off her busy schedule to meet with me. It's always such a pleasure uh, to speak with principals, administrators, educators who are doing such great work with our students. I, um, something else, the California Association for Bilingual Education, or CABE as uh, many of us know it, hosted their annual event in Anaheim this year, and I was able to attend once again uh, their Administrative Leadership Symposium. And I was very pleased to see district staff in attendance. This session addressed critical elements in education that um, are required to lead school districts through the 21st century. We received presentations um, on the most current ELA reading and biliteracy research the dual responsibility of the ELA reading and ELD policies, and the state of ELA reading in America. They presented on the laws and policies that have changed the course of reading assessment, data analysis, curriculum development, and daily reading and ELD instruction. The CAVE Symposium is a valuable um, and relevant opportunity for educators at all levels to increase our understanding and language in of our students. I hope that our district leaders in attendance will apply what they learned at the uh, CAVE conference here at our district to better meet the needs of our English learners and multilingual learners. And then just last but not least, I definitely want to wish uh, our Jordan Panthers luck in New York. I know they're going to shine. I know they're going to do well. Go Panthers. Thank you. Um, I'd like to um, thank the AAUW for their annual STEM conference. This was the 20th anniversary. And um, this year they had a keynote speaker, Miss um, Alexandra Hurtado, and she has a Bachelor of Science in Molecular Biology. And she inspired, so incredible. She inspired our middle school girls with um, 
with her experience being in school, and she was discouraged by a teacher to um, maybe not pursue a career in science because of her looks, because she's very pretty. And so this teacher <laughs> discouraged her love of science, which is so bizarre. I thought we were past all that kind of thing, but apparently not. Um, anyhow, she spoke about being discouraged by the teacher, but actually being inspired because she had a part-time job and she worked in a restaurant and there was a dishwasher, a gentleman in his 40s, I want to say, who was working towards a goal. And he had this goal of, you know, whatever it was. And she was so inspired by this gentleman and he told her, you have to follow your dreams. You, and she continued her education and then she's, she's also, um, She's also working on a master's in something, and uh, she was just incredible. But we had um, students from Franklin, Hamilton, Hughes, Jefferson, Lindbergh, Muir, Powell, Robinson, Stevens, and Washington. Uh, 234 students were provided with opportunities and ideas in, in let's see, uh, workshops in engineering, careers, uh, architect, uh, architecture, and uh, medical careers. Really a great day, and you know, thank you to the good work of the AAUW. And then also our Black, Hi Black History Month celebrations, there were a lot of them. We had a celebration right here in this room um, that was put on by staff, and it was a beautiful celebration. We had um, performances by uh, students from different schools, um, dance performances, spoken word. There were two little sisters, and I'm gonna tell you, um, the littlest sister, she came out here. She was, um, the well, the older sister was handed the microphone, but the little sister says, where's my stage? Where's the stage? It was the cutest thing. It was so adorable, but she meant it. She was serious. And then she grabbed that mic away from her sister, and together they did a, a poem. And then there was um, a young woman, oh, was she from Browning, the one that did the spoken word? Or um, was she from Browning? Oh my goodness. She got up there and she delivered this speech well, actually, she started with a song. She started a cappella with a song and then delivered this speech that was so powerful. You, I mean, you felt it in your, in your bones. It was incredible. So we had that celebration here. We had the big celebration um, uptown. Thank you very much. Um, on, on a, what day of the week was that? Was that a Friday, a Saturday? On a Saturday, it was fabulous. Again, more performances, dancers, singers, um, uh, spoken word. I know there was this one young lady, she was all by herself on the stage. I thought maybe she was 10, 11, 12, something like that. Turns out she's a first grader, and she is dressed in this beautiful, um, you know, kind of a ball gown thing, and she belted out a Whitney Houston song. She belted out this song. She commanded that stage. That was very fun to watch. Um, there was um, a celebration at Webster I attended, so thank you everybody at Webster. Oh, that was an after-school program. Kids volunteered to uh, stay after school for this um, one program. They, they did a drum circle and dancing and singing, and uh, I think they had around 60 kids involved. That was wonderful. And then at Holmes, they did the most uh, comprehensive Black History Month celebration that I've attended this, this season because they had every student involved. They had students um, do uh, research assignments and then they had like this uh, museum kind of gallery walk where kids from this classroom cycled through this room and they had kids presenting. And so there were kids wearing mustaches, they were fake. Those mustaches were fake. And um, glass, they dressed as the um, uh, people from history that they had researched and, and written about. 
And it was so wonderful to sit in front of a child and for them to be able to tell you about that person's life and why they were significant in history. So they had that which was in the classrooms. They had an event outside that was um, centered around food. <laughs> so wonderful. Um, so uh, different creations that were started by black people. Uh, macaroni and cheese, potato chips. Turns out that was an accident, um, but a lot of good things are. Uh, so I want to thank everybody at Homes because they did such a great job. Oh, and I forgot, in the library they did this whole hip hop presentation and, and it was very enjoyable, very wonderful. And then I had an opportunity to see a production at Poly they did a musical called um, Something Rotten. So I'm going to have to say, so champions and scholars, yes, but how about champion scholars and artists? I was so impressed by these performances. And I have to give a shout out to the teachers because a lot of these teachers are putting in extra time to do things like choreography. I, I talked to some of the teachers afterwards and um, I asked, you know, who their choreographer was. This is an English teacher, and she's also the choreographer. And the the students uh, participated not just on stage, but stage crew, the orchestra, um, all aspects of the theater. So that's um, incredible. And they did a fantastic job, fantastic job. And then uh, Milliken this last weekend, I saw Legally Blonde. I believe they're doing Legally Blonde this weekend as well. So if you have a chance. It is a great performance. Um, it's amazing what these um, kids can do. And again, kids in the orchestra, kids on stage, kids backstage, um, very fun, very fun. So always a lot of wonderful things going on. And um, I wanna congratulate my colleagues, Mr. Otto. Um, congratulations on your appointment or reappointment because you get to continue and congratulations, Mr. Miller, because it looks like the numbers are in your favor. I don't know if you've called it yet, but. We got till March 29th. You have till March 29th. Okay, I'm a little early on that. I'll save it, but um, I think we'll go to Dr. Baker and our superintendent's report. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to continue to highlight some amazing things happening in our district. And I wanna start by the announcement that four of our secondary schools have become distinguished schools. Really important moment. First time for Stevens Middle School. Give them a big shout out. Uh, Stanford Middle School, Sato Academy of Math and Science, and California Academy of Math and Science. We will be celebrating these schools at a ceremony in May um, where the schools will be highlighted and have an opportunity for photos and to just really appreciate the hard work of their teachers and administrators and all that goes into becoming a distinguished school. So super proud of them. And then Dr. Benitez, building on your um, celebration of the community-based organization, Appreciation Breakfast, just wanna do a tremendous shout out for the first of its kind. And thank you, Dr. Brown and Dr. Benitez, you were there along with, let's see if there were 120 plus guests, you were there with at least 118 other people. That is amazing, 36 community-based organizations that were represented, building their relationship with the district, building their relationship with one another, learning about the vision and thinking about our, our aspiration to be an open system that thinks about the village of the cities we serve and the children that we serve and how we can better work together in service to to our young people so just really proud of that event even though i couldn't be there myself uh, in addition to women's history month thank you axel for your um, celebration at the start of the meeting this month is also developmental disabilities month and national social worker month so we know there will be different kinds of celebrations taking place across the district in honor of those two areas. This Friday, Cabrillo High School will have its 10th <coughs> annual Women in STEM event that is a, um, an all-day event that also features a lunch speaker for highlighting women in the STEM industry and how they can be mentors and highlight the work that they do. And I just want to thank Ken Fisher, who has led that for 10 years from a, his teaching position and beautiful work that he does, and in this case, uplifting women 
who um, are, can inspire other young women to go into fields of STEM. STEM fields, thank you. Um, and then lastly, two other things. We are into our Quality Core Instruction second PD cycle, which I'll just go back and say, this has been an, a tremendous investment in our ESSER funds to provide intentional and well thought out release time for every single teacher in Long Beach Unified School District to go through learning cycles with curriculum staff and with their department heads and colleagues in their area of, of subject matter, so elementary teachers with elementary teachers and then departments. So just tremendous work with Dr. Lund and the um, Office of Curriculum Instruction and Professional Development. So to this point, we've had 44, 450 teachers with really high ratings about both the content at a 98% rating that the content was relevant and 95% rating that the, um, the day of learning will help them improve their practice. And I say those numbers to also say we're asking, and I know the team is really invested in hearing from teachers about their experience and improving the use of feedback from the quality core instruction first cycle to think about how to improve the second cycle and the results are, are bearing out that way. And then lastly, just uh, gratitude to Jonah McGee in the high school office who leads our connection to historically black colleges and universities. Um, had a parent workshop on the weekend on Saturday, March 2nd, with 36 students attending, 20 parents across nine schools, helping families, both students who are interested as well as families, feel a connection and have supports and thinking about how they might make an application to a historically black college and university. We also recently had a number of students attending the Los Angeles Historically Black College and University who received scholarships right on the spot. Um, so really, really good effort, and I want to just express my appreciation to Jonah. All right, and that concludes my report for this evening. Thank you. Um, thank you. I think we have um, a request on adjourning in someone's honor, and before um, I hand it off to Mr. Miller, our next regular board meeting is March 20th. Mr. Miller. Thank you, President Kirk. So. Uh, when I attended uh, Bobby Smith Elementary's Black History event, um, there was also an opportunity to celebrate one of their longtime employees and Miss Yvonne Marshall. And so uh, she was a staple for that campus, uh, so much so they have uh, dedicated uh, the rec shed in her honor. And so uh, with the impact that she left, uh, on not only that campus, but our district, uh, it is my privilege to read uh, the dedication that they wrote for her. So Ms. Marshall was a long-standing member of Bobby Smith's community as a recreation aide slash supervisor, parent and grandparent. Ms. Marshall's five children all attended Smith as well as nine of her grandchildren. Since Ms. Marshall was so active and involved as a parent at Smith, she was offered an employment she was offered employment as a rec aide back in 1990. Shortly after her career began, she was promoted to recreation leader because of her hard work and dedication to the Smith School. Ms. Marshall's official retirement from Smith was in 2011, yet she missed the children in her job so much. <laughs> uh, uh, the children and her job supervising the school playground so much that she returned back and stayed there until uh, 2022. As a rec aide, Ms. Marshall was known for her kind, supportive, and fir firm demeanor with the children. She was dedicated at her job and positively influenced so many students and staff members throughout her 30-year tenure service. Ms. Marshall passed away in 2023. As a remembrance of her legacy, the Smith staff honored Ms. Marshall with repainting of the ball shed and a plaque. The plaque highlighting her career and presence as a Smith bear, which will be placed in the newly beautified shed. Ms. Marshall will forever be remembered to, to Smith School as a devoted mother, grandmother, and rec aide. Thank you, Ms. Marshall, for your commitment to the students, families, and staff at Smith. You will be missed. Well, thank you for sharing that. It kind of highlights the fact that we have so many wonderful people that are working with our kids day in and day out. 
Well, that concludes the business of this meeting. So without objection, we'll adjourn.